Hey, this episode of the Majority Report is uh, sponsored in part by our buddies over at Sunset Lake CBD.com. Um, they helped us out on our uh, fundraiser and want to just would have a nod to them and and thank them uh they gave a thousand dollars to the gofundme for our support of uh, afghan refugees um and they're also having an end of summer sale the whole month of september is um in their end of summer sale it is 50 percent off all hand trimmed hemp flower smalls and keef Matt just uh, Matt just paid attention to the show. That's what I'm Stop talking about. That <laughs> Keith, like a week. He's like, wait, what? Fifty percent off the Smalls, the Keefe. Yeah, the sale runs through the end uh, of the month of September. Um, they are ramping up for their 2021 harvest season. So to celebrate, fifty percent off all of their premium hemp flower. Just use the code Flower Power at checkout. For everything else, you got left is best. It gets you 20% off. They're gummies. They're tinctures. Uh, they have tinctures now with CBD and um, uh, what is it? Uh, melatonin. Hmm. And um, they've got uh, balm with Arnica and CBD. They have uh, coffee that has uh, CBD in it. They have uh, fudge. You got to check it out. The, um, all of their products, 100% uh, pesticide free. They use integrated pest management, organic fertilizer, integrated um, uh, integrated uh, uh, farming practices, um, and they, with help of the University of Vermont, their business practices also great. Fifteen dollar minimum wage. Company is mostly employee owned, and they are movement partners. So check them out. Left is best. gets you 20% off. Flower Power gets you 50% off all of their premium hemp flower, uh, their smalls, and their keef. So check it out. Flower Power at checkout. And also, don't forget that uh, if you uh, get on a subscription service with them, 25% off those products. So uh, check it out. SunsetLakeCBD.com. If you check out our YouTube or our podcast description, you will get all of those um, promo codes and those deals there. Uh, SunsetLakeCBD.com. And now, time for the show. The Majority Report with Sam Cedar, where every day is casual Friday. That means Monday is Casual Monday, Tuesday, Casual Tuesday, Wednesday, Casual Hump Day, Thursday, Casual Thurs, that's what we call it, and Friday, Casual Shabbat. The Majority Report with Sam Cedar. It is Friday. September 10th, 2021. My name is Sam Cedar. This is the five-time award-winning Majority Report. We are broadcasting live steps from the industrially ravaged Gowanus Canal in the heartland of America, downtown Brooklyn, USA. On the program today, Washington, D.C. Bureau Chief of The Intercept, also host of Hill's uh, Uprise, uh, Rising, Ryan Grimm will be joining us to look back on the week that was and in addition to that um, piece they broke in The Intercept about uh, Joe Manchin's daughter. And then uh, later in the program, um, Matthew Film Guy will join us. They reminisce a little bit about uh, 9-11. Also on the program today, Joe Biden announces massive new testing and vaccination mandates and right wing heads explode but the majority of US citizens support that mandate meanwhile the DOJ sues Texas over its abortion ban and the sliced and diced reconciliation bill is making its way through five different house committees we'll talk to Ryan Grimm about what he's heard the latest on that Meanwhile, Joe Biden withdraws his 
Alcohol, Tobacco, Firearms nominee. As the nominee was too anti-gun for, at the very least, Angus King from Maine and, of course, Joe Manchin. Air Force Inspector General says the Air Force and Space Force rife with sexual harassment and racial bias. Jar Bolsonaro bans social media from removing misinformation. Coincidentally, so does uh, Governor Abbott in Texas. Free speech in Brazil. There you go. And lastly, Gavin Newsom seems to be polling well in the California recall campaign. Joe Biden will be the latest Democrat out there to campaign with him. All that and more on today's program. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, thanks for joining us. Emma Vigeland continues her vacation. Uh, she will be back with us on Monday, as, as, as I will as well uh, be back on Monday. But it's a little bit early to talk about Monday. We still have Friday to go. Uh, the big news, of course, is that uh, the Biden administration announced last night sweeping vaccine mandates for federal workers, for federal contractors, and under the auspices of OSHA, this is the uh, Safety and Health Administration, the Office of Safety, Health, and Administration in the federal government. This is the agency that says um, you must have proper ventilation for your workers in a pandemic. You must have other practices to maintain the safety and health of your employees. Well, they will uh, issue a, another regulation, which is your employees, if you have a entity that is over 100 employees must be vaccinated or must receive testing on a weekly basis. It's not so much a mandate for the private sector as much as it is an ultimatum on this regulation. Uh, here is Joe Biden announcing this. In addition, there are other uh, aspects of this. And here's Joe Biden. We need to do more. This is not about freedom or personal choice. It's about protecting yourself and those around you, the people you work with, the people you care about, the people you love. My job as president is to protect all Americans. So tonight, I'm announcing that the Department of Labor is developing an emergency rule to require all employers with 100 or more employees that together employ over 80 million workers to ensure their workforces are fully vaccinated or show a negative test at least once a week. Some of the biggest companies are already requiring this. United Airlines, Disney, Tyson's Food, and even Fox News. The bottom line, we're going to protect vaccinated workers from unvaccinated coworkers. We're going to reduce the spread of COVID-19 by increasing the share of the workforce that is vaccinated in businesses all across America. My plan will extend the vaccination requirements that I previously issued in the healthcare field. Already, I've announced we'll be requiring vaccinations at all nursing home workers who treat patients on Medicare and Medicaid because I have that federal authority. Tonight, I'm using that same authority to expand that to cover those who work in hospitals, home health care facilities, or other medical facilities. A total of 17 million health care workers. If you're seeking care at a health facility, you should be able to know that the people treating you are vaccinated. Simple, straightforward, period. Next, I will sign an executive order that will now require all executive branch federal employees to be vaccinated, all. And I've signed another executive order that will require federal contractors to do the same. If you want to work with the federal government and do business with us, get vaccinated. There it is. And uh, pretty big news. And I can tell you, um, 
you know, we'll talk more about this as the program goes on, but I can tell you that just even the, the, the health care stuff, um, I, personally, that is a, uh, a big issue in my extended family. Um, and I imagine that is the case for millions and millions of other Americans. Um, we'll talk more about the political implications of this. Now, of course, the big news for the vast majority of us um, watching that clip is uh, that there's going to be a vaccine mandate for federal workers um, and a vaccine, I guess, ultimatum uh, for private workers. You got to you got to make sure you're tested or you get vaccinated. But for some, there was other news that became really surprising. Here is a uh, tweet from Todd Starnes. He is a on the um, on the Salem podcast, Salem Radio Network, Salem Radio Network. This is a right wing radio network. And this is uh, this is pretty sad stuff. Uh, go ahead. Show this. This is uh, watching someone's heartbreak. Will you pop that up? That tweet? Here it is. Um, Biden says that even Fox News has a mandatory vaccine policy, which incidentally was a great uh, thing to drop in there. And in many respects, probably for the same reason. Is that true? Question mark. That can't be true. <laughs> Have Hannity and Tucker and the others gotten the vaccine? That just can't be true. Um, heartbreaking to see someone. This is like when you, you know, where you tell people, you know, you never want to meet your heroes in real life. Yeah. Uh, it's one of those moments, right? Uh, where um, uh, it's, and, and, and frankly, I mean, this had been reported before, but not, nobody had made that much of a big deal about it, right? Because Tucker Carlson, whenever he was asked if he was vaccinated, claimed that was like asking uh, someone, you know, what your favorite sexual position was for some reason. I have never worked at any place that has demanded I have a favorite sexual position or, or that they have said exactly what it should be. Um, i trying to remember if that was in that um, questionnaire I filled out prior to. When we hired you here? <laughs> yes. That was, I, that may have been back at that time, maybe. Um, but there's another theory, too, that Todd Starnes is still mad that he got fired from Fox News and wanted to make it clear to Fox News viewers that those people who are telling you that you didn't, you, you know, that the vaccine you should be skeptical of are actually huge, massive hypocrites and, in fact, have been all vaccinated themselves. Yeah, they've been all taken it. I mean, Starnes was fired from Fox News because he claimed that Democrats do not believe in the Christian God and instead may worship Moloch, a pagan god synonymous with child sacrifice. Yeah, yeah I mean, news guy. I mean, he's willing to go there where, like... <laughs> <laughs> he's willing to speak the truth. Not. And so, in other words, Fox News censored him. Yeah, exactly. hey, the censorship is... Well, everywhere. he's just asking questions. Why is there such a conspiracy in the media now to uh, hide the fact that maybe Democrats worship Moloch. The media rushes to judgment with the liberal group think, and it's horrible to watch. Horrible to watch. All right, we're going to take a quick break. Um, and when we come back, we'll be talking to Ryan Grimm, bureau chief at uh, the DC Bureau of The Intercept. Folks, a couple of sponsors today. Uh, as you know, dinner time can be rather uh, chaotic. Um, Maybe you have a busy uh, lifestyle. Maybe you have kids. Maybe you don't like to cook. Well, with Freshly, it's easy. Freshly's chefs take care of your meals a few nights a week, and they take the pressure off of you. Freshly offers chef-made, nutrient-packed, delicious meals delivered fresh to your door. You don't have any cooking to do. None required. With Freshly, your meals arrive cooked and fresh every week, so you can keep your fridge stocked and skip the trip to the store. Ordering, super easy. All you do is you go visit Freshly.com. You choose from over 30 meals, like steak, peppercorn, sausage, baked penne, and their chicken pesto bowl. Freshly, it can fit your lifestyle. They have a variety of plans. They have a bunch of different meals to pick from, and it all is catered towards your needs, towards your preferences, and towards your tastes. Your meals are ready to heat and enjoy in less than three minutes. Or about three minutes. People know this story. I've told it many times on the program. When uh, my sisters and I decided that my mom uh, needed basically meals delivered to her, uh, 
We wanted to make sure that she was eating uh, properly and not having to cook. But we also knew that she wouldn't accept them from us uh, if she thought we were paying for them. So uh, my sister did research. She looked around for what was, was the highest rated meals. And we got Freshly. My mom loved it. And we told her that Freshly was a sponsor of the show and they'd give me a lifetime supply, which of course was a little bit of a fib. Then coincidentally, a year later, Freshly um, reaches out to us and says, can we advertise without knowing the story, obviously. And uh, I told the story and my mom found out that we had been lying to her. But she loves uh, the steak peppercorn and that, um, that trumped all. So right now, Freshly is offering our listeners $40 off your first two orders when you go to Freshly.com slash majority. Stop stressing about dinner. Go to Freshly.com slash majority for $40 off your first two orders. That's Freshly.com slash majority for $40 off your first two orders. Also, uh, folks know that uh, for a long time, I uh, was uh, against the use of deodorant. Why? Because I didn't want to put any of those chemicals in my system. And um, it was marginally successful. Sometimes it was, I stunk. Uh, and so uh, fortunately, I was introduced to native because uh, sometimes life stinks, sometimes you stink. And, um, but with native, you don't have to. Native is all about stopping the stink the right way with products like their legendary aluminum-free deodorant. They also have body wash, toothpaste, and they have a brand new mineral-based sunscreen, which was huge for me when I went to the beach with Saul this uh, past month. Um, wasn't greasy in any way, super easy to apply. He liked it, I liked it, obviously. Native's on a mission to overhaul your entire hygiene routine by putting the care in self-care with products that are carefully made to work against odor, that are made with simple ingredients and smell great. You can get their deodorant and body wash in amazing scents like coconut and vanilla, which happens to be Myla's favorite, citrus and herbal musk. I'm not a big musk fan myself, but the, uh, the coconut and vanilla is fantastic. Or you can check out their new limited edition fall coffee house collection with scents like oat milk latte, matcha, and sweet cream. And for me, they have the native deodorant that is unscented. You can even build your own personalized product bundles and mix and match through your favorite scents. Um, honestly, I couldn't be happier with native. Um, like I say, I like the unscented, but I also feel great that I'm not putting that stuff in my uh, uh, in my body. Stay fresh, stay clean with Native by going to nativedeo.com slash majority report, or you use the promo code majority report at checkout. You get 20% off your first order. That's nativedeo.com slash majority report, or promo code majority report at checkout. You get 20% off your first order. And lastly, um, not going to reiterate the story of my having um, food poisoning this week, but I will tell you, um, it was a, a revelation to have um, to have uh, my uh, Hello Toshi modern bidet on my toilet this week. Bringing the big guns. Exactly. <laughs> I had never contemplated the implications of my uh, my bidet. Um, when it came to something like food poisoning, but I can tell you, winner, winner, um, I guess bad chicken dinner really would be. <laughs> but Tushy is the modern day for people who, you know, go to the bathroom and poop. You just poop, you wash, you pat dry. The Tushy bidet washes your bum with water for a better clean than toilet paper. Washing with water, I can tell you, much less irritating, much more soothing for your body, particularly that part. I mean, you can't wash with paper. No, you can't. Tushy Bidet is easy to install, super easy to install. It attaches to the toilet in under 10 minutes. No electricity needed, no uh, uh, plumbing needed. Using a Tushy Bidet reduces your toilet paper use by 80%. It saves you money. It is eco-friendly. It is stylish. And it really is a revelation. Start washing with a Tushy Bidet for a better clean. Go to hellotushy.com slash majority and get 10% off plus free shipping. This is a special offer for our listeners at hellotushy.com slash majority. 10% off. After you buy and install your Tushy, show it off. 
tag at hello tushy on instagram all right want to uh welcome back to the program dc bureau chief of the intercept also host of the hills uh rising youtube daily show uh ryan grim ryan welcome back to the program see you sam I want to talk about um, your big story uh, uh, that that you guys ran the other day about Joe Manchin's daughter. But uh, first, let's talk about the the sort of the the, the mandate. That's obviously the big news of the day. Um, this is a big deal, I think. Um, both from a policy, public health policy standpoint, and also I think what is really not. I think appreciated. This is a big political move too for for Joe Biden. What what's your sense of this? Yes, I think it is a it's a huge political move. What you want you want to talk about the politics of it? Well, let's. But, I mean, let's just. I mean, broadly speaking, from a policy standpoint, like I mean, I think it makes some sense, right? I mean, the, we're watching state by state yeah. where the vaccination rates are lower um, go into crisis mode about their ICU. We, I think there's yeah. even more data than there was a couple of months ago that the vaccination, A, protects you from the Delta variant uh, in terms of, of, of catching it, but also an enormous protection in terms of getting seriously ill. I mean, so from the public policy standpoint, I think it's pretty clear why you do this. But let's talk about the politics behind this. Yeah. So it's, it's interesting. I, so on the one hand, I think they they resisted doing this as long as possible. You know, they were, they were hoping that this surge, that there would not be a surge. They were hoping like the rest of us were in the spring, that it was going to wane. We we're going to have a hot girl summer. Uh, you know, it's we're moving on with our lives and everything's opening up. Um, that didn't happen. Thousands of people dying a day. Uh, and so in, on, on the one hand, you know, they're, they're pushed into this situation. Uh, but I, I do think actually there is an argument to be made that the politics work out for them. Now, they're certainly going to anger some segment of the population that, and some segment of that population uh, aligns with Democrats. So it'll be interesting to see if um, there's any reaction in the California recall. Like, let's see if let's see if anybody gets any voters there get pissed at Democrats and come out and. And well, wait a second. I mean, a you, protest vote. Okay, so wait a second. The 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 people that they piss off, um, you've got a Venn diagram, right, of people who would vote for Democrats, and, and we're not talking about intensity here. We're just talking about just you know, right. If if someone could show up at their door and say, "Here's a ballot, and please, I'm not going to leave until you until you vote." Mm -hmm. You got a you got a Venn diagram, right? You get the circle of people who are going to vote for Democrats. You get the circle of people who are going to vote for Republicans. Are there, do you think there's really any significant number of people who would vote for Democrats who are, would be mad about this mandate at this point? I, this is, I don't, I don't know. I don't, I don't, I, I wouldn't rule it out. Uh, I think it's possible. I, I, I think it's far outweighed by the number of people who are going to be, uh, who are going to be excited and enthusiastic about it. Um, and I think it's, outweighed by the number of, pe of people on the Republican side who I, who avoiding a vaccine has become part of their identity. Right. And we're, and we're going to be angry anyway. And so that was the other point that I was getting to that the interesting politics here are that what this, and then the way he framed it also, like the way he framed his speech was In aimed, fact, was aimed let's at play this clip. Like, we have yeah, this yeah. clip. This is where he, he does it because I think there's, there's two things that are going on here. I mean, there's one, this is a wedge issue in some respects, right? Because you've got 65 to 70% of the population mm -hmm. who are already double vaccinated, 65%, and around the exact same number who are in favor of a mandate. I don't right. think it's much of a coincidence, <laughs> yes. right? Uh, and But here's how he framed it here. Uh, 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 play this clip. My message to unvaccinated Americans is this. What more is there to wait for? What more do you need to see? We've made vaccinations free, safe, and convenient. The vaccine is FDA approval. Over 200 million Americans have gotten at least one shot. We've been patient, 
but our patience is wearing thin, and your refusal has cost all of us. So please, do the right thing. But just don't take it from me. me. Listen to the voices of unvaccinated Americans who are lying in hospitals. All right, that's beds. good. I think we get the, the, the point. I mean, because, I mean, there he is saying something that I think, like, probably 150 million Americans have said at one point or another, <laughs> like almost word for word, right? Right. What are you waiting for? Right. And he did not have to frame it that way. Like, there was an Obama-esque version of that speech that he could have given that would have used lots of passive voice and you know tried to coax people into the into the light he didn't do that he's like what are you waiting for like you're you're messing this whole thing up for everybody else like it's just that's practically a quote <laughs> like yeah um and so there's a choice in framing it that way and the political result of framing it that way is that you isolate this minority of people uh, and you you polarize the country around that min, that minority. If all you do is watch cable news, you might think this is a 50-50 question, which the, which the politics of isolating a question, a 50-50 question are very different right. than isolating a 70-30 or 80-20, or even 65-35 question. And Democrats very rarely take take the opportunity to polarize around an issue where they're in they're in, in the vast majority and not and once you polarize it then you also then trigger the most extreme voices so this minority half of whom are have reasonable uh you know skepticism and fear about about the unknown um but then the other half who are just not so like identity driven opponents those are the ones who are going to be loudest and so then the rest of the country who's like, what are you waiting for? Just sees them as that much nuttier and they continue to become even more isolated and then they continue to grow their majority. That would be the theory at least. Right, I mean, this is the functional equivalent of the Biden administration appointing Marjorie Taylor Greene as the majority leader in the house. Right. right? I mean, I, I mean- or, I, like Hil or like Hillary getting Trump nominated. Right. Well, yes. Right. I mean, there's. Sorry. I mean, well, that's that, that's the downside of this. And, right. and you know, and, and the Obama administration, the Obama did that too. If you remember, in 2009, they uh, touted Rush Limbaugh as the intellectual pillar of the uh, of the <laughs> Republican Party. I mean, you remember those first mm -hmm. like, six months? I mean, look, Rush Limbaugh was the only Republican they would address almost on some level. Mm -hmm. Um, so there's some times where it works and some times where it doesn't. <laughs> and, <laughs> and and that's that's the thing about this, is that, which is is tough to predict. And and it, and it makes it sort of a bold move by the the Biden White House in the way that they approach this because this seems like it, it to me it is more um, of a no brainer if we are going into a general election as opposed to a midterm election right because a midterm election is about enthusiasm mm -hmm. and the question is is you know are you making the anti vaxxers which the overlay, in my estimation, you know, that Venn diagram, and I'm talking the anti-vaxxers, not right. the people who are saying it's been inconvenient or I just haven't had the time or I'm afraid to take off time from work because this addresses that for a lot of those people because it, there's the mandate comes with a mandate for employers to give people time off, paid time off mm -hmm. to get vaccinated and to deal with the fallout from it, which I think is really important. But in terms of that anti-vaxxer group, they were already going to come out and vote against, right. you know, in, in this midterm election. And maybe you've sealed a deal. I don't know that you've motivated um, pro-vaccination, pro-vaccination mandate people enough with this. But that's an attempt to do it, right? Mm -hmm. by, by not making it a passive thing, by saying, like, I'm protecting the grievance of the rest of us who are like, we want to get this thing over with. And you guys are out there saying like, I don't know, mm -hmm. ivermectin is the way, is is the panacea or something. Yeah, it, it, it gives them something to fight for. It gives that, because the, the complacency is, is the thing that creates all of these midterm backlashes after uh, a, a party comes into power. Like the, the political science is kind of in on that. The, the the majority party's uh, voters are happy that their that their man is in the White House, 
And so they don't show up enough of them, like a, a 10% or what, you know, a significant number don't show up because they're good. We're fine. What do we need to, right. what, what, what do we care? I'm, I'm busy. I got better things to do. The, the party that's out is angry that, you know, every single day is another microaggression seeing this, this person in the white house. And so they get motivated to go out. And so this, I think gives some motivation to the, to the majority, like to the, to Democrats to go out and, and show that they're, because they're pitted in this fight, you know, what's, what, what doesn't, what, what makes the political science not necessarily reliable going forward is that we're in such a tense time now that everything is fraught and being fought out in a way that it wasn't before. Right. And so if this culture war, and it's a culture war, like he's, he's, he's polarizing it around culture. Uh, if this culture war is going to be decided at the midterms, then you can't, you can't ever rest on your laurels in a culture war. You know, if you've got the, if you, if it's all just politics or electoral politics and your party controls the white house, you can take it easy. But if it's an ongoing culture war, you've got to constantly keep coming out. And so that, that could have an influence on on turnout, I think, in a, in, a, in a way that this time benefits Democrats. Well, we, yes. I mean, what's fascinating about this is, right, there's, there's two big elements that we don't know. I mean, again, you know, if the, uh, if the election was this November instead of a year from November, uh, it, things obviously would be clear. But the Republicans are organizing around these anti-mask, you know, like anti-mask and anti-vax. It's quite possible that because of this vaccine mandate, six months from now, to come out and say, like, I'm against masks, everybody will be like, well, yeah, but we're not wearing them anymore. Right, cool, good. Yeah, me too. <laughs> we're, the, the, yeah, the pandemic's mostly over now. And so as as the variants are the are the variable. Well, of course, that's exactly. Right. We don't know. And and um, and so it's possible, you know, the the thing that makes this both like a a, a political weapon to wield and a good pu a public policy could also make it a political weapon that sort of diffuses mm -hmm. where the Republicans have placed all their eggs in the basket, right? Like there's not, they're not going to get the same sort of salience out of Joe Biden seems to be a fuddy duddy. And uh, right. we got to get really angry about this. There, all the anger is coming from the the anti mask van, um, you know, anti maskers and the anti vaxxers. And if, if six to eight months from now, you know, the, the, the country is a lot like, let's say, New York uh, in terms of what we're seeing for or, or less. Um, the the Republicans are they're going to it's going to be hard for them to find something to get angry about. Right. Uh, because. Right. Exactly. Because if you're everyone's against uh, masking and everyone's against locking down in a time when there's when you don't have to do it. Right. <laughs> so. If, if they're like, let's stop wearing masks. I'm against lockdowns. No more lockdowns. You're like, well, there is no lockdown. We're not wearing masks. I think that's exactly right. No, if, if that is the situation in November, 2022, and, and let's say it, it, you know, the, the pandemic eases because the variants burned out, uh, you know, Delta was, is Delta is like ticking downward right now. I mean, hopefully we're at the peak and it's coming down. They, they, they also might've timed it for now so that they can, you know, causally point to their uh, intervention and say, look, here's the date, you know, and you'll see these right. charts and they'll be disingenuous right. in some ways. Right. But like, look at, it's just like you can look now at the chart of January 20th inauguration. It's like the, the peak of the entire ep pandemic so far is like January 20th. 20, right. And as soon as Biden got in, he was able to drop <laughs> but it. It's disingenuous showing. to be like, look, Biden himself like dragged this down. But you'll you'll see a little dot. Biden introduces right. vaccine mandate, and then you'll see Delta numbers coming down. If they stay down and flatten out, um, and then there's and then restrictions are lifted, I think you're right that the politics all uh militate toward him. I imagine this time around too, the Biden administration is going to be a little bit slower to roll out the mission accomplished banner uh, because you, you know, one of the depressing things about this, you know, by, by the time we got to July was like in May, it looked like 
mm-hmm. it's going to be the you know the the you know the summer of love and mm-hmm. uh, it didn't work out that way the other element that that could be interesting to work into this is sort of like a little bit tangential although you know uh, jim jordan uh, i think it was this week you know hinted at this is that you know we're talking about negative partisanship driving poll number you know driving people to the polls between now and um, the midterm, Donald Trump could mm-hmm. be running for re-election, and that was the you know that then all of a sudden we get to like a almost like a rough facsimile of 2018, right? Where mm-hmm. you can vote against Donald Trump today before he even's even running by coming out and voting against him in the midterm. It'll be the second time Democrats are rooting for Trump to run for president. Well, yeah, exactly. Uh, exactly. Um, but this time, there's no risk that he'll be elected in 2022. Exactly. <laughs> so exactly. In, their, in their short-term interests, they're like, yeah, come on out. Um, and I think you know, the more that, that they polarize around these more extreme issues, it, the harder it does get for him um, you know, to win in 2024. But like we, we already saw them, you know. Uh, well, bundle, and this time too, points. I think there is a um, a there. You don't have to sell the the idea to uh, Democrats that Donald Trump can win, right? <laughs> right. No, I mean, that, that was a right. that was also a big factor. It wasn't just that they conv- yeah. they they wanted Donald Trump to run. It was that they didn't think he could win. Yeah. Uh, and uh, this time around, I think there would be a, a little more savvy about that. All right. Actually, so, like they were in twenty twenty. Right. Exactly. Yeah. And and so let's all right. So let's turn from that, because the other thing that, you know, and it's it's fun to be able to talk about uh, things where there's a political advantage for Democrats and a massive public policy advantage for all of us, um, you know, and in, in moving from the vaccine mandate to, you know, what's winding through Congress as we speak. There are five committees that are, uh, you know, uh, looking at different aspects of the $3.5 trillion budget uh, bill, uh, the reconciliation bill. Um, and, and here's how we, you know, I'm going to tie in on your story. Um, Joe Manchin comes out last week or end of last week, maybe beginning this week, um, and says, yeah, I'm looking at something that's more like $1 trillion. I yeah. could see myself going up to $1.5 trillion, but $3.5 trillion, we couldn't possibly do because, and then mumble, mumble, something inflation, <laughs> mumble, mumble. National uh, security in the national deficit. Yeah. Security, I, you know, I don't know what else comes after those words, but it, it's just sort of mumble, mumble. Uh, institution, Senate, something, something. Um, so, like, first off, what's your sense? And there was already, I think uh, Stephanie Murphy came out and said she, from Florida in the House that she's not, she's going to vote against it already because it, it's not, she doesn't have enough time to read it. Uh-huh. Um, and um, what's your sense of where it's, what the, where, it, what, what's the state of play in the House and, uh, you know, the Senate? And then let's talk about the implications of, of your, you know, blockbuster story because, you know, people say uh, Joe Biden, LBJ. Well, LBJ <laughs> me, would be would have would would. He'd know would, what to do with it. He'd know what to do with that story. It seems to be. But, so then yeah, the House, is, I think, yes, yeah, Stephanie Murphy likely no. Uh, Kurt Schrader, former head of the Blue Dogs, I think is a pretty solid no. Um, Jared Golden, lean lean no, but like gettable. Um, but then everybody else, like every, pretty much everybody else is a likely, you know, is, is, is gettable. Like those are the two. Um, and, and they, they have, they, they have a margin three. of three, right? right. <laughs> Although they have Alcee Hastings seat is open and a Chantel Brown will win in November. And, uh, the Ohio governor, uh, did like did an, an incredible job screwing Democrats um, in in keeping that seat open as long as humanly possible. Right. Uh, which is going to, which there were plenty of other people to run HUD. Like Biden didn't need to, and 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 Pelosi finally was like, stop. Like after he picked plucked Deb Holland out of the house, he, he's like, she's like, stop. Like, right. what are you we doing? Don't- you're making my job much harder because <laughs> like, you're giving me a much thinner margin. And then if somebody dies, like Alcee Hastings, right. um, you know that election 
So, the, you know, their cushion grows the longer they wait. Um, but the longer they wait, the harder it gets. Um, so they, they, you know, it's still alive, but yes. Yeah, so in the, on, in the Senate, it's Biden, uh, you know, it's, it's mansion and cinema, but with, with mansion really stealing a lot of that, a lot of that thunder, a lot of that spotlight. And yeah, so he said, uh, he doesn't want to do 3.5 trillion, uh, one to 1. 1.5. And, and he even said in the wall street journal, anybody who thinks this is political posturing should just Consider the words of Admiral Mike Mullen, who said that national security is compromised by the deficit. It's like you set us up there like you're about to say something important. <laughs> <laughs> and then you finish the sentence with the deficit. Talking about but Mike Mullen talking about the deficit. <laughs> what, like, what does he know about the deficit? But, but now, wait a second. See, here's the thing that I don't even understand that as a talking point, because is the reconciliation bill, at least in the context of like 10 years out, and we know there's all sorts of gimmicks and whatnot and, uh, you know, associated with this. But my understanding is like, doesn't that have to be deficit neutral under the reconciliation no. rules? Or no, it does not. It, it, it doesn't. It's whatever you write into the rules. Okay. And so and the, the tax cut that, that Trump did was allowed to be, I forget what exactly, but like 1.6 trillion under the deficit. Like, so it's what it's whatever you write into the so it could actually include uh 6.5 trillion dollars in spending and as long as it had 3 trillion in in pay for us is is I think my understanding of how this I haven't read these instructions but that would be in line with how instructions like this would be passed so it doesn't have to be deficit neutral it's whatever you write into the instructions and there's not going to be $3.5 trillion of new revenue, although it could right? be. Well, well man, that's the thing that, is that's the rub. Could, yeah. That's the thing is that, you know, the, and, and we should be clear here. I mean, you know, cause I, I, uh, I know a lot of our viewers are, you know, modern monetary theorists and the, there's two ways in which you use taxes. Uh, one is, to placate people who say you need to pay for something. <laughs> and then the other is to basically deal with wealth inequality mm -hmm. and to discourage behavior that you don't want to have to take place. And so today I um, uh, read a report that um, Sherrod Brown and Ron Wyden are going to introduce a provision to tax uh, stock buybacks, mm -hmm. which stock buybacks are very problematic. Um, Part of a sort of um, a real, um, I think, drag on the functioning of corporations that you combine with uh, the changes in capital gains taxes and the idea of stock buybacks uh, back in the early 80s under Reagan. And you start having board of directors and C-suite people basically having a cottage uh, industry, which is a side bet to what their company is actually doing. Like, you know, I can make all my money by just simply, um, you know, increasing our profits by cutting our workers. The health of the company, you know, five, 10 years from now is not really an issue to my pay because I, I'm tied to the stock price and the stock price isn't necessarily associated with the health of my company 10, 15, 20 years down the road and certainly not the community or anything else. Um, and so, um, you know, to, to tax the stock buybacks, you know, deals with wealth inequality and also sort of like changes a, um, you know, uh, uh, realigns some incentives when it comes right. to corporate governance. Um, and so what, 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 what does a Joe Manchin do at that point where if people are like, well, you know, you're worried about the deficit, you know, OK, uh, let's tax more. Well, what he does is tries to push down the spending number so that there's less pressure on Congress to come up with those types of taxes and so i think that's a, that's basically what's going on here he doesn't that's his two-step he right. he's worried he doesn't want the taxes but he can't and say that pretending it's right. about the spending right yes that, i think that's exactly right yeah and we have uh, there was also a story about heidi heitkamp out uh right. doing a similar thing on this the, you know, and it's it's a little bit complicated in terms of like the stepped up basis for inheritance tax. But if, you know, um, you know, if, if uh, mom or dad owns a house and uh, they give it to me 
and they bought it for two hundred thousand dollars and now it's worth uh, two million dollars they give it to me at two million dollars and anything above that is what i got to pay taxes on uh, essentially if i sell it as opposed to like wait this is accrued by uh the the, the capital gains has gone up and um heitkamp was said that was a racket to get rid of that and then Right. And there, there's all sort, but there's all sorts of exceptions for, for property and for, for those types of hand, uh, hand, hand downs or whatever you call it. Um, but, and the, the, the more common scenario is somebody inherits a, a trust with filled with common stock worth $20 million that, you know, is made up of $15 million of, of which is, is capital gains. And so if the purse, if the, if the, if the dad had sold it, you know, would owe 5 million bucks right now, because he died and passed it down, that's wiped out. And, and now all of this G stock or this Apple stock, it's as if you just bought it today. Um, even though you're the, you know, the kid or the grandkid of the person who bought it and all of that, all of that's gone. So that, that like when people don't, People would much rather talk about a family farm like Heidi Hyde Camp wants to do, even though farms are just like we've heard that talking point so many times that they've written into the law a million times. It's not going to take your farm. <laughs> right. <laughs> it's in, it's like right in that's it's practically the legislative language. Stop worrying about your farm. It's not about your farm. It's about your Apple stock. Uh, you know, or what, whatever. And, and it's Apple stock that's like over at least $2 million worth, right? You get $2 million the first, worth $2 that million was bought in like 1985. Yeah. Right. All right. Well, let's, let's talk about this story that you guys did. You broke about, um, about uh, Joe Manchin's daughter. Her name is Heather Bresch, right? Mm -hmm. uh, tell us about this story because this, it seems to me, uh, should, if I'm Joe, Man one would hope Joe Manchin would be like, hey, I'm not going <laughs> to make too much of a stink right now maybe the opposite but but tell us the story well myelin pharmaceuticals is the it's the currently the distributor of epipen and it's for years it was a kind of the pride of west the pride of morgantown you know this homegrown um west virginia pharmaceutical company that 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 uh that trafficked in a lot of generics like so like really making the world a better place like producing cheap you know, affordable medications for people. Uh, so Heather, Heather Bresch got a, got, gets a job uh, working for them in the 2000s. 2007, she gets promoted to uh, chief operating officer, which is the first scandal that, that hits the family because she had been claiming for a long time that she had this executive business degree and a master's from West Virginia University. And so like a good local paper, the Pittsburgh Post-Gazette, because it's Pittsburgh's like the biggest city near there called West Virginia university. You, you can call the registrar and ask about anybody's degree. I once called asked if Yusuf Aloteba had actually graduated from Georgetown. Like he claims to have, he's the ambassador from the UAE. They're like, Nope, he didn't <laughs> like, Oh, good. Nice, <laughs> nice little nugget from my profile there. Um, and so they're like, no, no, she's like halfway there. Like she's not, not even close. It's not like, Oh, she didn't turn in her final paper. Not even close. So, Pittsburgh paper reports that. Uh, then they get a call from the school. There was a mistake. Uh, the governor's daughter, in fact, uh, did. Manchin was governor at the time. Manchin's governor in his second Co term. Coincidence? Yes. Uh, he, he did. Oh, no, the end of his first term. He So they they run this correction. We're sorry. How could we have done this? She did. She does have a master's degree. Um, enough people knew that she did not because she wasn't even close that they then had to, there were protests at the school. They had to, they had to do an actual investigation where they hired an independent kind of legal team to like look into it. And they found that they had the school in response to the paper had like actively just fabricated grades and classes and everything to like give her this, this degree. It led to the resignations of all the top leadership at, the, at West Virginia university, a huge college um the only consequence for bresh was that it she no longer listed that on her bio on, oh, on you, gotta, you gotta go back you gotta get uh, copies of your cv i mean yeah. that's not nothing <laughs> right update, I mean, update you gotta update your linkedin can, so she continued rising she becomes uh ceo sh shortly thereafter president and ceo of myelin pharmaceuticals uh mansion's wife her mother 
uh, becomes the top lobbyist for the Association of School Boards, which will become relevant in a second. Um, so in in so she, Mylan owned the the right to distribute EpiPen. It was made by it was the medicine was actually made by this other company, which uh, was was getting purchased by by Pfizer. Pfizer also made a competitor, kind of generic ish competitor called Adrenaclick. So now Mylan was facing the possibility that that Pfizer is going to own not just part of EpiPen, but also own this generic ish competitor to it. And so I got an email that the subject of which is our discussion. And it's from Heather Bresch to Ian Reed, who is the CEO of Pfizer. She's saying, just wanted to confirm our discussion that after your purchase of King Pharmaceutical, uh, that you're going to divest from Adrenaclick. Just want to make sure we're all in the same, because like, I saw you close today. She's now, wasting no mean, time. What does that mean, divest from my, like what are the implications of that, that what, that what company it, basically goes under? What it meant is they pulled Adrenaclick off the market. Okay. Yep. That, that's, that's what they ultimately did later that year, in fact. So that that's so what- So in other words, there's no competitor to EpiPen. Right. Right. Now so, that you've bought the, now that you've bought the supplier of the, like the medicine that goes inside the EpiPen, you're going to get rid of the other distribution mechanism in the ep in the click. And so that we're going to have no competitor and you're going to have no, you know, and, and we're, you're going to be our sole supplier. So we've right. created this sort of monopoly on both levels. Right. And then it's just off to the races because what right. happens to the price of EpiPen that went from a hundred dollars, right. To, to well over $600. And then, Ooh. and then instantly like within, like, as this is going on, in fact, uh, the, her executive team comes up with the idea: Why are since people are going to die, you know, if they don't use the EpiPen at, immediately when they need it, why are we allowing them to just buy one? Like, if we force them to buy two, they will buy two rather than die. And the internally, they're writing about it in language like that: like this is a matter of life or death for people. They will purchase two if we force them to. And so they 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 concoct this, what they call project X2, which is to eliminate the, uh, the single EpiPen pack. And they're not selling you two of them, you know, for the price of one or two at a discount. It's, they're just doubling the price and forcing you to buy two. I, I got an email from uh, a sales associate to the medical team saying, Hey, I need a quote medical rationale for this. Cause I'm oh. supposed to present this to Heather. And then later I got an email from the CEO saying like, yeah, the medical folks say that we can't really use medical guidelines to, to drive this because it's, it's not, it's not true. Right. There's <laughs> actually no reason why right. from a medical standpoint, why you need two EpiPens right. as if opposed to one if EpiPen. You're, you, if you're a patient, you probably rather have two in case one misfires or something. I could understand why somebody would want to have two, but you don't, you don't need to have two. And if you're doubling the price and you're keeping it from somebody, that's probably, that's probably worse. So they push this through, they talk to Pfizer and they're like, they're, I have emails say Pfizer's all in that, you know, they like this idea. Somebody says, what about the FDA? And, and somebody else says, uh, don't call a right to FDA because it would raise more questions than we have answers. And so what's, other words, this yeah. is a classic better to apologize than ask yes. permission type of scenario. And somebody's like, what about all the payers, the insurers? And they're like, well, we're, we're under a billion in revenue. I think we'll quote fly under the radar. Like, so the, they're, they're, they're conspiring to conceal the scheme from the regulators and from the people that are going to be uh, paying for it. And what's so amazing to me is, is that it, sh it shows how endemic this, this stuff is in the industry, that they would just be hashing this out over email. Right. That like, this is, they, they don't feel like as, as sort of like grotesque as this is and arguably illicit. Right? Mm -hmm. or, or, no, yeah, yeah. no, you you could easily have. Uh, in fact, they're getting sued for it right now, and and plenty of those plaintiffs' attorneys would say uh, this 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 borders into criminal territory. And so the idea that they don't even feel like we need to hide our tracks, it's more like, this is not like, you know, you right. would imagine like the, the CEO of the co company would not be, be, you know, laying it out there. Now, uh, he, he, there's no record in the exhibits of Ian Reed replying to that email. So it, he might've been like, oh, gee, I, Jesus Christ. <laughs> like we, we talked put it in email. We talked about this on the phone. Never <laughs> For email. For a reason, <laughs> what are you doing? Um, 
So, so yeah, the price went up over six hundred dollars. Um, she she then did face some scrutiny in twenty sixteen when it hit that number. Oh, and Gail Manchin then lobbied all of these school districts to require these schools to purchase EpiPens. So that helped drive up the price too. Uh, so she she did appear in front of Congress, but at the time there wasn't this evidence of her, you know, of her directly talking about this discussion uh, with Ian Reid. This this only came out through a uh, unsealed as part of this court case last week. Um, so it it really ties every ties it all together and, and links it with the Project X two because right like, and and the the other salesperson is also like saying that this is medically necessary also is a bit inconsistent because we're only doing it in the US. <laughs> well, you know, the Europeans, they uh, they have a different, uh, they have- they, Their bodies, different, doses, different allergies. Exactly, yeah. uh, the EpiPen. And, and we should say, so um, uh, uh, Bresch uh, leaves, right? In, after the investigations into this, and uh, sadly only got like a, what? Like a $30 36, million dollar payout? 36 million or something. So, and actually the company I mean, was sold to Pfizer. Uh, ah. So Pfizer just gobbled the whole thing up. And then uh, it's now uh, Viatris, I think, is is the company that owns this part of Mylan. And so they, at the same month that, that Bresch left with her $30 plus million package, closed down the Morgantown plant the, the, with 1,500 jobs lost. So it's not even that all of this corruption and self-dealing at least creates 1500 jobs for people in in Morgantown like the plant is getting closed um and it's like come on mansion like you can't like you you can ask for anything you want in this reconciliation package if you ask for 50 million dollars a year for the next 100 years like to keep this plant going producing generics doing research for West Virginia University what that Schumer would give that to you before you could finish asking for it right Okay, so with all this said, I mean, call, call off, it the Heather Bresh. Well, research. that's actually yes, we were talking about that, right? Like the um, what was it, the Cornhusker kickback, right? And uh, what 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 else do they call it? The uh, Florida uh, flim flam, the Louisiana purchase, the Louisiana purchase, the Florida flim flam, and the uh, Cornhusker kickback were the things that the right wing were talking about no. uh, when it came to the ACA. I think um, I think that's what John McCain was actually calling them at the time. You know, it's a way of trying to maybe distance himself from his savings and loans issue uh, yes. back in the day is Keating seven or whatever it was. And so, all right, well, uh, all right. So let me ask you this. I mean, and, and I should say the, the the story that you've written is both. Um, I mean, it's it is uh, it's an amazing insight into the what's going on with the pharmaceuticals as to like why we pay so much for these pharmaceuticals i mean you know these are not like bit players pfizer right. is not <laughs> pfizer, a big player they're a big deal they're, they're a big deal um and you know they're just a little more sophisticated like you don't use the email folks like and, and you know we you don't send emails you don't do it that way i, I don't that probably went in my spam folder is what they probably are trained mm -hmm. to say at that point and I never saw it. Don't remember um, that discussion. Yeah, I don't. I don't remember that phone call at all. Um, and it also talks about the obvious corruption that is uh, associated with uh, Joe Manchin. Uh, I don't think it was a coincidence that West Virginia University calls back and says, "Actually, no, we we right. we wrote out all these grades." So, like, how does this get leveraged at this point? I mean, you know, look, I um, it 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 would. It's gross that these things are not, you know, there's no accountability for it, but there's not going to be. So the question becomes like, how does, how do we take this uh, lemon, which is Joe Manson's, uh, you know, uh, family is incredibly corrupt um, and turn it into some lemonade where that ultimately leads to an expansion of Medicare, uh, mm -hmm. you know, uh, better Medicare services, uh, home health care and paid sick leave, et cetera, et cetera. Well, Manchin's objective here is to come out of this in a better political position than he went into it. So to the extent that that's not happening, then th that disincentivizes whatever behavior he's engaging in is, is the way is the way I would put it. And I think Daniel Bogus Law at The Intercept also did a really good piece the week before um, investigating his coal empire, because people don't realize after he was elected to the state 
uh, the House of Delegates in, in West Virginia, he then opened a coal company. He, he you know, launched his own coal brokerage firm. And you know, which is a common pastime of West Virginia politicians. You do the politics first, and that leads to the wealth. And so that's that. Those companies are now owned or operated, or they're not operated by Joe Manchin the Fourth, Joe Manchin, who is Joe Manchin's son. But he, but Manchin himself is still a, a major owner. He report he's reported more than four million dollars in in income, you know, from from these coal businesses since he's been elected to the Senate. He's making every year something like half a million dollars from these businesses. Uh, he has he he says he put them in a blind trust, but if you if it's a company that you own <laughs> what does that mean yeah as you know I'm no, you still I'm own no it. longer doing business decisions but you know it's a coal company right. so you're going to do stuff so that the coal business just broadly speaking is benefited because you have a coal business i mean it's really just sort of like I don't know. I, I have an ice cream uh, uh, business, but I have no say on how they operate. I'm just making the laws as to what constitutes good nutrition. And I just happen to think it's ice cream. And I think sherbet should be banned. Exactly. 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 I just, I just do. It's just, it's terrible. It's gross. It's gross. It's me. It's throw you out not, of here. It's not no. really a dessert thing. So, I mean, w you know, so Does, right. So if if it look if if his motivations appear to be driven by support for the pharmaceutical industry, which his family's making tens of million dollars and 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 engaged in possibly illegal schemes, and his family's making millions of dollars from the coal industry, that 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 drains some of the energy out of his, uh, you know, out of his like attempts to portray himself as this person who's just just looking out for the deficit here to whom to whom does that like i mean like who's the audience that he's he's playing right. well it, it ha well it has to be i mean it has to become a dominant public narrative like you'd have to have msnbc rachel maddow and chris hayes uh lawrence o'donnell like it's not impossible um uh, but but they'd have to decide to, to Cover the story cover, and, and have to decide to cover politics in a in a way that that includes that is more holistic than than the media tends to cover politics. Well, it's, you know, we the, the media covers politics as as a horse race and as a competition between competing ideas. Right, as conservatives to, and liberals and moderates and de deficit hawks, and as opposed to no, this this is a coal baron, right? And a pharmaceutical executives right. uh dad you know who has particular interests at play here all right well uh there it is uh anybody's uh listening uh back at msnbc this will be on the choice but not necessarily have the same range as it would uh <laughs> if if the uh, varsity team uh took it up um ryan grimm um, thank you so much. We'll put a link to these stories. People should pass these stories around. Send them to your favorite uh, news host uh, and have them repeat them. Uh, Ryan, thanks so much for your time. Really appreciate it. Real pleasure. All right. We're going to take a quick break. Right back and finish this up. I mean, one of the things I think is very difficult for people to wrap their heads around. I, I mean, I have been doing this for 16, 17 years, and I still have trouble wrapping my heads around. Like, how greedy <laughs> these people are and how much they're motivated by their own um, enriching themselves, our politicians, and, like, you know... A couple million. Okay, but like, do you really need more? Like, are you really willing to I mean, trade? Politics has worked well for Manchin. His daughter got that job because when he had that coal consultancy and he was a state senator, he was sitting next to the Mylan CEO at a West Virginia Mountaineers basketball game and said, hey, my daughter needs a job. And she got a job. I mean, <laughs> your daughter's set. Dude, go on, you know, go retire for God's sakes. I just don't get it. But 
Uh, find uh, the, that intercept story. We'll put a link to it and spread it around, folks. Uh, for those of you watching us on Peacock, we will see you on Monday. And for the rest of you, we're going to have uh, Matthew Film Guy on, uh, well, I guess uh, just after we play the thing. I'm a drink, I'm a... I got that. Try to... Yeah, let's play it now. Just a reminder, it's your support that makes this show possible. You can become a member at jointhemajorityreport.com. Also, uh, check out Left Reckoning. Well, why don't you tell us what's on Left Reckoning? Oh, yeah, we had Brian Muir talking about uh, Bolsonaro's bus bozos um, in front of the Supreme Court this week. We also talked about, actually, the story, Ryan Grimm, uh, about the EpiPens, and we went deeper into the West Virginia uh, fake uh, business degree. And we also talked about, uh, I forget the other thing we talked about, but we talked about a third thing. Uh, so patreon.com slash left reckoning to get the post game uh, where we talk about Terry Albury, the uh, FBI whistleblower who has some interesting uh, insights into how, uh, I guess, race racially sensitive FBI agents are, which is to say, uh, not much. <laughs> <laughs> Wanting to sue Obama for not having a white uh, history day, that sort of thing. Oh, my God. Um, so uh, that's on the Patreon. So patreon.com slash left reckoning. We're closing in on 900 patrons. I love how um, she can uh, lie about her degree, and the the the, the blowback on that is uh, she gets promoted, and then ultimately gets a thirty six million dollar uh, uh, golden parachute. Yeah, yeah, it's thirty seven point six actually. And the funny thing yeah. about it is, like, when she's asked, she's like, "Can you can um, the Pittsburgh Post Gazette was like, can we get?" A copy of your transcripts to see what you got and they're like no actually i think my word and the word of the university is actually all that you need that's <laughs> so, it that's right nice you don't need plan. anything specific <laughs> yeah um all right let's uh I'm bring we'll bring in i guess i gotta get rid of that like uh that that <laughs> thing in between the two desks it didn't quite work out um hold on just take it easy matthew i'm just take it easy, buddy. There we go. Matthew, the film guy is choosing your streams. Cassavetes on Netflix and other such things. Maybe I'll watch one and learn a few things. Please recommend me a movie to stream. Matthew, Matthew, please recommend me a movie to stream. So yes, ladies. Yes, ladies and gentlemen, uh, it is Matthew Film Guy. And let me just—I'm gonna do, just gonna pull the curtain behind, uh, pull the uh, curtain back on the inner workings of the show and the way that we book this. Now, originally, I had pre-taped Russ Feingold, Senator Russ, former uh, Senator Russ Feingold, uh, and was is intending to play it today. We were gonna have uh, Grim on yesterday. But the last minute, uh, Grimm had uh, had to, had to cancel, which you know happens rarely. It happens a lot with a guy like Grimm, actually. I gotta, I'm not gonna lie. Uh, I think it's like the third time he's done that in the history of the show. Now he's been on the show, you know, more times than most people. So and he's busy. And so I was like, we we made like a, a late call, like around I don't know 11 a.m. or 11:30, even to say like, let's run the fine gold interview. You know, so it's. Tomorrow, September 10th, September 9th is just as legitimate and this and that. And it'll make sense to talk about the week in politics with, with Grimm. And uh, there's going to be this vaccine mandate and, and et cetera, et cetera. And I thought maybe I'll talk to, about, uh, to Grimm about 9-11. We ran out of time and, and all the things that happened. And then just over the course of the week, I'm like, uh, who are we going to have on this weekend? I can't remember. When was the last time Matthew was on? Uh, we'll have Matthew on. And then... Um, I, I forgot that, like you know, you're a you're you're an appropriate uh, sort of nine uh, eleven twentieth anniversary guest um, to have on for the second, you know, like the the sort of the, the fun halfish, the, the because you know our work together was very much implicated by uh, nine eleven. I mean that you know that. Uh, our the the forging of our uh, friendship was uh very much around pivoted around 9 11 in, in a weird way didn't it 
It did indeed. And, you know, and just in general, I'm the perfect substitution for fine gold. That's I've done that no, many, you're many not times. The sub, no, you no, you missed. He no. and I are, I mean, no, no, no. no. I mean, I think of me when I think of. You're not okay. the substitution for fine gold. I'm saying okay. that if I had somebody in this. That's going on my resume. You know, wanted to talk about 9-11, you're the most appropriate person that just worked out that way. He and I both took a principled stand against the uh, USA Patriot Act. I think that's one thing we have in common. All right, let's not list all the things I have in common with fine gold. I think we just But did. yeah, indeed, that's just the start of it, but I won't go into it. Uh, indeed, Sam, uh, you know, we were in the midst of. When, when I when I when I texted you yesterday? Yeah, absolutely. Well, you said absolutely it did. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Um we can we can discuss that. But yeah, you know, we had just gotten off the set of a film, a, a comedy about terrorism being enacted against tall buildings in New York City, and uh, lo and behold, the shit happened for real. Uh yeah. and it definitely put a a, a crimp in both of our careers, let's just get at the top. What was the main problem? Uh, right. I mean, this is on some level, you know, like uh, talking about that. But, you know, that's the thing is that we, we had fine gold on. And so it's, you know, not like we haven't addressed the topic in, in it's really sort of the most important way. But this is our sort of our lighter thing that I can't help but think of of Sarah Silverman's joke uh, about 9-11, which, if I recall, was something to the effect. That, and this was, you know, sort of, you know, the. Uh, after 9-11, there was a big thing in comedy. Do you remember that? Like, you know, irony yeah. is dead, and when is it appropriate to talk about it? Yeah. And Sarah had a joke, There's and a, I can't remember where she came when she came out with it, but it was like, I'm never going to forget 9-11. That's the day my boyfriend dumped me, and yeah. that was like... That was in Jesus' magic, yeah. yeah. And they just came out with a documentary. I don't know if you heard about it. I haven't seen it, called it Too Soon, that basically is about interviewing comedians about how they got back into doing comedy after 9-11 and what that, was, that whole scene was like. I think Marin may have been interviewed for oh, but I, I didn't, no i haven't heard about that but um yeah i mean listen it's gallows humor is a very legitimate form of healing i find it suits me it worked for me at the time i mean at the time we were just just completely just traumatized it's the only word for it um but as soon as we could find some way to uh you know cope with the horrors uh i know i took it so that's definitely uh yeah uh, you made part, a... part of the process yeah. So we should just say for people who aren't from familiar with what we're talking about, um, in in the in the in the winter of two thousand uh, one, somewhere around like I guess must have been about well it was probably like in February March, actually. Um, at, uh, oh, okay. That no, it was it was after that actually. So. Um, I had done a character um, in the run-up to the 2000 election. Um, a a Alan Lieberman, I think it was. And um, he was... Arthur. Huh? Don't make me have to remember your own character. Arthur no, Lieberman? He, no, Arthur was in the movie, but for some reason I changed oh. it from Alan to Arthur. I don't know why. Oh. And I had done this character, Alan Lieberman, Al Lieberman, um, and it was... You know, one of my sort of like anti-comedy bits where Joe Lieberman's ne'er-do-well son would go up and try and do stand-up. And I think at one point, like, I went with Janine to Syracuse University, and I would set up the video cameras to shoot the audience as I would do this. And I would just come out and say, like, you know, you got to vote for my dad. And um, and there was a whole story about how he was a um, a tennis pro in West Palm Beach and was pushing it and in fact that night of the election i called into um the best show on fmu it was very very early um i think that tom sharpling had launched that show it was on a tuesday night was the election obviously and i was on the phone with him as al lieberman and basically developed the character there uh you know in that moment but also had been doing it as stand-up and when the the, the Supreme Court um, uh, decided, uh, you know, Bush v. Gore. I had a lot of trouble with that. And I ended up writing sort of a script that I had already had sort of laid out for a New York Liberation Front, I think it was, and, and intertwined it with this story. And it 
it was a weird it was a weird story uh i don't you know it was a weird story but it involved I liked it. it involved uh joe lieberman's fictional son at the end firing a bazooka at a building in new york city and after also, he was radicalized by the orthodox jewish postal workers played by john benjamin and mark Marin. that's right and they radicalized him by showing him like something that was basically an homage to the parallax view about terrorist attacks and you know so you had postal workers there near the time of anthrax you had a theater takeover which happened in russia i don't know if people remembered that as well mm -hmm. all of this in there and we did the uh the the movie and i i don't i think it was sort of it was a little bit of a mess um you know it, Some you know production after, issues we had production issues it was hard uh, but there was a lot of different people like Colbert had like a little part in it. I think that ended up being on the cutting room floor, but I mean, in the was DVD a... extras available at your website. And, um, and so, uh, we, we did this and I, that's how I met Matthew, uh, Ray Carney, who was a professor up at BU. One of, uh, Matthew's professors said like, uh, who's the caboose. I asked him if he knew any people sent me Matthew. Matthew was going to be my assistant. He wasn't actually my professor, but we had a relationship anyway. All right, well, there you go. And Matthew was going to be my assistant and because uh, I was directing and acting. And to make sure that he was always around me, I also put him in the movie as my character's assistant so that he could carry yeah, around the notes for the directing and make it look like he was carrying around the character's notes. Uh, that was the way I rolled back in those days. And um, we did the movie eight weeks into editing. Um it was 9-11 and so inconvenient it was extremely inconvenient there was a a a, a the entity that had financed uh, requiem for a dream was financing the post-production i had financed the actual shooting from doing according to jim uh a sitcom and um and they uh, had never seen the script and so uh they wanted they, they, they called me at one point. They said, is this going to impact your movie? Because they sort of knew the vague outlines. I'm like, oh, it could cut both ways. And it was, it was uh, impossible to even imagine how anybody could watch this film at that point. Like, because it was about the muting of dissent and it created, but it was all not. It, 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 it was barely possible before. And then now, exactly. definitely. It, it was a really, it was, a, it was a niche film prior to that. Um, and a certain dark sense of humor. Yeah. They basically said like, um, and I told him, I, I can't output it from the avid until I pay the editor who was not you at the time. No, I remember. And, uh, so they sent me, I think like, you know, 10 grand and said, you can keep the money. Just don't put our name on the film. <laughs> and, uh, and, uh, so that's what happened. And it just sat for a couple of years until finally I said to Matthew, uh, will you finish editing it? And then you did. Um, and I think you did a very good job, all things considered. Thank you, Sam. And uh, I was very honored to uh, resurrect such a work of love, a labor of love, and something so potentially offensive to so many Americans in the yes. wake of such a tragedy. <laughs> yes. But guess what? It was funny. It was incisive. And um, it was one, I think, Bob Balaban casting away from being a classic. Yes. Uh, well, I, I imagine like uh, it, it ended up we uh, I was trying to get Bob Balaban. He couldn't do it. And so we ended up getting uh, Robert Schimmel. Rest I almost had Charlie Rose in it uh, until that last day. I mean, it's the story of the movie is much better than the movie, I think. But um, it's still worth seeing and purchasing. Uh, no, I'm pilot not, season DVDs. I'm not really com, trying to push right, it Sam? out that much. No, okay. but, I'll help you. Um, I know. I can... But but and then Matthew, uh, you know, you had showed me a a little short that you had made about nine eleven, which was really also a little bit disturbing. Uh, but well, was... that was. Can I just give us a little bit of background on that? That was actually commissioned by uh, two filmmakers who I'm huge uh, fans of and who I'd worked with uh, subsequently, Kaveh Zahedi and Jay Rosenblatt, they made a, a compendium film called Underground Zero, where they reached out to a lot of uh, independent and underground filmmakers to make short reactions to 9-11. And I decided to make one that was sort of, um, shall we say, a satirical look at the mass media, um, sort of uh, fetishization of the, the yeah. impact over and over and over. Uh, it went down uh, about as you could uh, 
understand it might at a few festivals. Uh, and it didn't actually make the cut for their release, but I still urge people to go out and check out Underground Zero, uh, a collection of really fine uh, short films. Not all of them funny, as you might imagine. Yeah, I mean, yours was, and you know, I just watched it, rewatched it uh, yesterday, and it 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 brought back how much they replayed those clips over and over. And in fact, for the first like five or ten years. Like, I, I don't know if MSNBC is uh, going to do it tomorrow, but th like they for for years not only replayed clips of it, they replayed the two hours of coverage starting with the moment that the plane said, like they just ran it. Yeah, it and was it, that whole, you know, uh, feedback loop. It looked like a movie and then it sort of became a movie and then it was on TV and it was exploited for its sort of sensational value. It was it was a mind fuck in a word. It was, I mean, I, you know, and, and, and it's hard, you know, I, I think everybody experienced it obviously differently, you know, maybe to some extent where you are. I mean, right. Like, you know, how do you, how do you contextualize your experience of something like this? Um, but, um, you know, I, I, I re remember that entire morning very explicitly. I, I got up, got into the, uh, was listening to Howard Stern. Somebody, uh, wow. Howard Stern was reporting that there was like a small plane that had landed into the uh, the Trade Center. They were like, just, you know, and they were sort of no, like joking around about it, but they were, you know, it was like, oh, you know, that guy, blah, blah. And then as I got out of the shower, I think it was, somebody had called in and said, Howard, I saw, that was not a small plane. I saw one of the, the wheels and it was a massive plane. It was like a 747. And then things started getting a little bit weird and... I went up onto the roof of my building, which was on uh, 29th and Park South at that time. And um, I'm pretty sure I have video of the explosion of the second one uh, coming out. The I've never looked at that oh, tape wow. again. Oh, wow. And uh, came down and my uh, then at that time, my, my girlfriend, who then ultimately became my wife and then ultimately my ex-wife, um, uh, she called me because she was on 7th Avenue. She lived right on 7th Avenue and heard the the explosion, came up. John Benjamin, who lived down below um, Canal, uh, within, you know, several blocks, came up because he was trying to get out of there. Um, and then we went to, uh, went downtown at that night because it was Eric Sloven's birthday. Who is the executive? He's the executive producer of uh, what was it? Of of two of of Broad City, right? And, and he uh, appears in Bad Situationist. Yeah, and uh, nobody else showed up at the party. It was just uh, Benjamin and I, and I think Janine uh, Garofalo were at the bar waiting. Like, where is everybody? And uh, but then they they cordoned off. You couldn't go below Houston uh, or yeah, Houston. I think it was. Uh, for for weeks, unless you had proof that you lived down there, and I went down with Benjamin the next day on the twelfth. Uh, we were on bikes, and 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 there was like inches of ash everywhere, covering everywhere. We went into his apartment to get his stuff. Uh, you know, we had bandanas on, and it was um, it was a very bizarre time. Uh, you know, my, it was insane. My, it was totally insane. And and I just had to explain it to Saul uh who's eight like i you know i didn't mm. get too graphic but he didn't know what it was um mm. and it's weird to me that you know we have people in the office who were like five at the time and get them uh, out huh and, and so i uh, very crazy i mean do you it, i feel like on some level it impacted our politics and sort of our political culture more than it did like our artistic culture. I mean, it impacted everything. Uh, you know, I, I even saying, on that morning. Out, 15 years out, 20 years out. I mean, listen, it. I think you can't separate it from the response that that had, I think, an effect on our artistic culture. You know, the, the sort of the war on terror, the complete, you know, the hyper power sort of doubling down all of that, I think, had an effect. And that was, if it was going to happen some other way, that was, I think, a, a major domino. And even on that morning, I remember when that even happened that morning, 
thinking, you know, I had seen enough dystopian uh, sci-fi and, and read enough dystopian sort of future comic books and things that I realized that this event is going to, it's like where the mirror universe branches off, if you know what I'm saying. This is, this is when the stuff starts to really uh, uh, become, you know, the mask is off and we're going to get the worst of human nature. And it's essentially what we did get. Uh, but I, I think, you know, a lot of popular culture and art reacted to that, uh, not necessarily 9-11 per se, because it's, you know, it's one of these horrible things that it just defies sort of, um, but where you know, do you it, see it that? defies critique. Huh? Where do you see that in our art today? Well, there's been a, there's been a, a, a slew of movies that basically deal with it deliberately but I also think that all the reaction to all of the things that came after it, uh, you know, many, many filmmakers, I mean, some are more sensationalistic. You know, you had Greengrass's Flight 93 and uh, uh, Oliver Stone's uh, World Trade Center. I mean, these are sort of the pop culture sort of yeah, you know, but the spectacle not, grinding it up. Right. Yeah, I mean, uh, you know, but I don't, I don't know. I don't know if I can tell you exactly where it feels that way because it's so pervasive. Like the whole post-war on terror world is so... Um, you know, fraught with this idea that, you know, the United States is this, uh, you know, global actor and we're, you know, cultural imperialist, war, you know, materialist imperialist. So, uh, you know, I don't know if I can necessarily tease that out for you directly. I'm trying to think of, you know, some filmmakers, uh, you know, addressed it directly and uh, some people avoided it, you know, like the plague, basically. But I'm talking about like, you know, uh, we had Spencer Ackerman on the other day and his book makes the argument that like you can track these things in sort of like our political culture mm -hmm. and in our, you know, that, that the, the, the way that 9-11 turned into a justification for uh, demonizing Muslims ended up being sort of like the bridge that reinvigorated, or that's a mixed metaphor there, I guess, but the became uh, sort of like an accelerant or um, a the catalyst to reignite or, you know, inflame uh, this sort of like ongoing, you know, uh, theme of, 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 of race in, that we've had in this country, obviously, since its founding. Um, and I try and think about like, you know, irony was not dead after that. But it did take a nap for a little bit. Did it though? Maybe. At least at least for a few months. I, I mean, mean, I'm just by the time, like, what, what's interesting is that there was no, you know, comedy didn't become political at all during that time. Uh, I mean, you know, I, I mean, I see it from, you know, from, from the perspective of somebody who was in comedy at that time, like, you know, the idea that, uh, Janine and I would 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 uh, go into politics was was completely absurd uh, to people. Um, now, people Still are a lot a more political. A little, little absurd. No, you're right. Not absurd. But now, but I, now comedians are much more political, right? I mean, now it seems like art is much more political now than it was uh, in the five years after 9/11. I don't know. I don't know. You'd have to give me. You'd have to give me some examples because I feel like it's always been that same thing. You know, there's there's that little thin. A line of uh, people who are being political, overtly political, and then there's entertainers. It's uh, it's not necessarily. I don't know if it got any more or less. I mean, you know, you have some musical responses, but unfortunately, I feel like the worst effect of it is that you know, to quote Guy Debord, the spectacle just absorbed that that all that stuff. So now we have like action movies, like uh, you know, Cloverfield or or uh, the Greengrass movie that basically used the uh the, the resonance of that moment just to make entertainment so i you know i don't know i'm, I'm struggling to think of a, a great example of how that that is true sam of where of of, of yeah. yeah that people became more political i mean listen i went on the iraq war march i did you know i all that stuff that bounced people that, did that become sort of, more political that was sort of the weird thing about it, it uh, yeah it, it's because it's because listen, we're in late stage, uh, you know, spectacle uh, triumphant. Like it's it's become harder and harder. And this is what you you know you work towards this every day is trying to reinstill a sense of collective possibility and a, a sense of actual of people is individuals having an effect on their society. Um, you know, I think art does have that uh, possible uh, power, but I think it's much more subtle and it's much more uh, personal than. Uh, you know, on, a, on an overt political level, at least that's what I concern myself with. But I don't know which which comedians. I mean, you had you had a 
you know, you had like the, the, the right wing comedians, you had like the, uh, you know, the uh, blue collar comedy and all that stuff. They had Dennis all that Miller. sort of punching down. Who? Dennis Miller. Dennis Miller. Yeah. You had, you had the sort of reactionary. I mean, this comes up too. every now and then it hasn't come up in a couple of years, but I want people to understand this. I have a Dennis Miller doll in this office. I, I know I, I sold a few on eBay. remember. And like, I like literally it would say stuff about uh, like, I don't, I don't know if it's around anymore. You could press the button and it would talk and it would say stuff it would like mock the french because they were hesitant to attack iraq but this Some is palestinian how, jokes is there a better yeah exactly is there a better example of of how dystopian things were after 9 11 that dennis miller was elevated to some type of right-wing hero so much so that they literally made an action figure with him and the dolls that were available cheney rumsfeld bush the Pope <laughs> and Coulter and uh, Dennis Miller. I kid you yeah. not. I mean, look at the, all the other pop culture things that came out, like um, uh, what's the, with the Kiefer Sutherland uh, terrorism show. Right. Uh, uh, 24. You know, it's it, it, the machine just kept churning. Actually, I think, I think the best, the best I humor. Things, I, I guess the culture just sort of actually, to the extent that you can measure the culture, the culture got more right wing. That's how I see it. I mean, I, I feel like it's a, it's been on a trajectory ever since the 60s, this sort of cultural, you know, pendulum. Um, I, I hope this generation moves it back the other way. I hope we get some of that stuff. But well, I uh, think that is it, happening. Don't you, though? I don't know, Sam. You're much more in touch with the pulse of the youth of today. You tell me. I, I mean, I know you're being facetious, but I'm saying, like, I think I definitely think so. I mean, I think that the culture is... Uh, I mean, I don't necessarily know if I would, I mean, well, yeah, I mean, look at, look at the, 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 the shows that we have, you know, like, I don't know, Succession or, um, you know, uh, what was that, uh, White, uh, Rose or what? what White well, Lotus. White Lotus. Or like I, mean, I Bo, hear that's very good. Uh, the Bo Burnham new stand-up comedy special, which is kind of just sounds, I haven't watched it, but it sounds like him just going on political rants and talking about neoliberalism and stuff oh, like that. Oh, there's a ton of that, though. Is I mean, it? there's a ton of politicization. I think part of that was um, was was maybe Trump, but I think part of it was also sort of like some type of backlash and, and sort of feeling that, you know, maybe Obama didn't, you know, provide the sort of the, 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 the I don't know, the, the re regeneration that he was supposed to i'm also thinking of our favorite show battlestar galactica they took a lot of pains to uh instill a sort of that's i mean true. it was much again that it was, was that secondary thing that iraq basically was its impetus that's right actually and that was that was quite early but see this is the problem i always run into with these things it's like it if it's popular entertainment or it's art right and you're trying to instill this sort of political message to what extent does the political message have to become so neutered and so sort of basic that it doesn't have any effect after a while. You just, you, is it worse to give the impression that you're getting a political message? So you go back to bed and you say, Oh, I'm, I'm woke. I know what's up. And then it doesn't actually affect any change. You know, it's, that's the tricky yeah. line you have to walk. There's this reality show. Um, that's like, who's going to be the next great American activist or something like that. And it's going to be judged by like a Jesus. panel of uh, yeah, CBS. Yeah. yeah I mean, Jesus. somebody just said I five comedy didn't become a political after nine. Of course it did. You remember borderline fascist and racist, like the media. I remember Ahmed, the dead terrorist. I mean, that's actually right. Actually. Yeah. The puppet like, guy. Yeah. yeah. That's, we had, um, that's what those two, uh, gray, uh, you know, Parker, uh, those two, um, libertarians who did South park. Um, they did that, uh, you know, America thing that, you know, blew up Janine and, and yeah. team America, which was, um, right wing Jeff Dunham. Yeah, no, I, I, now that I think about it, I guess maybe I blocked it out because the culture had actually become much more right wing. Sad, but true. I mean, look, the real artists are always going to be on the margins, always doing something that the popular culture isn't ready for. Um, that never changes, really. Uh, eventually, sometimes, you know, sometimes they move into the center and are feted and are, are appreciated, sometimes that way after their deaths. So I don't think we should expect anything else. Uh, it's just it's on us to go digging if we're if we're so motivated. And, you know, come join my film appreciation class and I'll show you multiple films where... <laughs> Hopefully something of value is being said that is not on the mainstream radar. 
Well, with that, I actually, uh, well, I just want to say what, what uh, the main joke I recall and it was uh, at some point I was shooting videos for uh, Todd Berry and Benjamin and Cross's uh, Tinkle. And they were discussing how they were going to go give, uh, I think, an entertainment night nightlife award or something to Todd Berry. I don't know if you were, were at this, um, but they were discussing their speech. And they decided that they were going to go up and just say, uh, this was like two years later, on the morning of September 11th, our world was changed forever. And the award for best comedian for the nightlife of 2003 <laughs> is Todd Berry. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, just to me is a perfect way because what do you how do you there's like you just you have to just recognize that we can laugh at it uh otherwise you'll go completely insane and i definitely another thing i want to mention about that morning uh is that i got a call from my father i was woken up by my roommate when the second plane hit he's like this is some real stuff so what was that like nine something much too early for me to normally get up but uh, we turned on the TV and it was just like insanity. And I got a call from my father and he said to me on that same day, like literally Osama bin Laden. So it was already in the zeitgeist that, you know, the Muslim terrorists, the Islamic terrorists were, you know, it's like the story was already there. You know, we had already had, we had the USS Cole. We obviously had the bombing in 93. It but, was- But but people thought, um the Oklahoma federal building, the first thing right. people to do was also was, was, uh, you know, the yeah. Islamic terrorism. So I'm just saying it's sort of, it already fit into a, you know, we already had our way, our lens of looking at it. It just so happens it possibly was, uh, you know, uh, Islamic terrorism. Uh, I say possibly because I don't want to get added by the loose change people, but, uh, it's the, you know, uh, it was just, so obvious to to even the sort of cursory uh cursorily invest invested people in politics uh it just it was a hard i don't know it just it just speaks to the, the the state of where people were at even even then before that um when you're talking about what where the culture was going yeah yeah it, it just it wasn't it just didn't seem as um I don't know. It, uh, it it didn't seem as as prominent, but yes, there was there was that narrative was there. And uh, I didn't personally go down below Canal Street for I think like five years. Uh, honestly, I think even when I went to Ducati Park in 2011, it was the first time I had really like been down there uh, because of how because uh, I I was at the time temping right near there at the American Express building, so I could have been there uh, at that time doing doing some office work, you know. Um, so that building I, you know, had a lot of shattered uh, glass, and um, um, in fact, that's I think where one of the principals from that uh, that film company that was providing me the funds they lived it like. Oh, right really? Building, yeah. I didn't know um, that. Uh, anyway, it, it should. Have I you ever sure. been to the nine eleven memorial? I've uh, yeah. I yeah. have since, been. And since since then. I have. I've actually been a part of sort of a. Uh, corporate events that like bring people in and that part of the tour, you know, that you, you, cause you recall the, the yeah, idea that like good, good people time. in Times Square asking you wh which way to nine 11, oh, how right. do I get to nine yes. 11? You I know, it's, that. That it's achieved horrible. that status. Um, so I've been to, I've been to some of those uh, down there and uh, you know, fr quite frankly, it creeps me out. I had to get out of town. I went out of town with some friends very shortly thereafter. Thankfully they had a, a place upstate. So I didn't come back for, I don't know, a week that I can recall. Uh, right. I mean, it's it's a, it's a, it's a little bit tough. I do remember at one point um, the biggest shift for me was um, the I had been arguing with uh, NBC about beat cops, and they're like, they may want to shoot it up in Canada, and I'm like, Canada? It's about two police New York City police officers on the street. Like literally, the whole thing was shot on the street. Can't go to you can't go to Toronto. And then they called in like uh, October and they're like, they want to shoot in Toronto. And I'm like, you got it. Yeah. Shoot up it was good, it was good enough for Jackie Chan uh, to do Rumble in the Bronx there. It's good enough for Sam Cedar and, and Beat Cops. All right. So uh, let's, um, uh, let's, do you got something for us that is, that harkens, uh, that harkens to uh, now? Or did you forget that uh, tomorrow's now? Oh, is it tomorrow? <laughs> Actually, uh, I did want to say one thing, um, uh, uh, just as a side note before I get to that. 
uh, the guy who, the filmmaker who uh, did the Underground Zero uh, film collection, his name's Kaveh Zahedi. Are you familiar with him? I don't know if you ever met him. He's another guy that I know through Ray Carney. He's a, a fan of his work. No, he, I worked on his film, uh, I Am a Sex Addict. Uh, and I think in the past, I recommended his show called The Show About the Show, which every episode is about the making of the previous episode. And he sort of mines his own uh, personal life extremely honestly to make this sort of recursive autobiographical oh, show. That sounds great. It's incredible. It also ruined his marriage, uh, which was probably on the rocks anyway, but it's all in the film. It's all in the show. Um, so right now he's doing a uh, Kickstarter to get the uh, fourth season, actually the third season, which the fourth season is going to be about the third season um, funded. And he's only about $2,000 away. So I, I want to urge people to go to uh, Kaveh Zahedi uh, on Twitter. And he's actually doing a telethon tomorrow featuring a ton of really great people from uh Rick Linkletter, Will Oldham, a lot of the people he's worked with in the past, filmmakers and artists who are doing like a sort of Jerry Lewis style telethon to get him over the edge for his Kickstarter. And uh, I just want to boost the signal on that a little bit. Kaveh Zahedi, Z-A-H-E-D-I. And his first name's Kaveh, C-A-V-E-H. But anyway, we'll put that great guy, descriptions. a willing uh, uh, subject to mine his life, his personal life. And it's the, the show is, it's like, you can't look away. It's so compelling and... Uh, he believes in radical honesty, total honesty, and I believe that is what led to his divorce. But um, this is, uh, I just, <laughs> I just well, wanted to... Is that, is, that, is that covered in the show? Oh, yes, it is. Interesting. Very, very much so. Um, and sometimes when he couldn't get people to, like, recreate what happened, he would hire actors to play them. So at a certain point, his wife uh, decided she's not going to be in it anymore, so he got an actress to play his wife. It's, oh, my you, God. It, you, you've got to see it it's it's extremely unique and extremely compelling um and uh he's the guy's a genius i guess um, once you go through the divorce if it causes the divorce you're at that point like i gotta i gotta keep doing this show like i've like you know the 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 uh the the, the sunk costs are just too high <laughs> basically yeah but all of his films his whole life has been very autobiographical so it's sort of just like the uh the the, the sort of a, the apotheosis of, of his his sort of style um, but in any case, I just wanted to plug that real quick for him. Um, so the movie that I actually want to pick today is actually something that he reminded me of. Uh, he just came out with an article. He's doing a lot of press for this uh, uh, fundraiser. And uh, he listed some of his favorite films. And it's also one of my favorite films. And it's called Wax or the Discovery of Television Among the Bees. And it's an early 90s shot on basically uh, analog video using some of the very early, I want to say not video toaster, slightly more professional, but like video effects. And it is a mind bending kind of trip of a film uh, about the sort of, um, I don't know, the, the liminal world, the world of the dead mixed with a lot of military industrial complex. Uh, he's like a designer of uh, targeting systems for weapons, but the bees start to talk to him and he's uh, channeling the spirit of his dead grandfather who gave him the bees. It's, it defies uh, a description. It is one of the most unique uh, films ever made. And it is actually available. The filmmaker's name is David Blair. It's actually available for free on his website, along with, which I haven't seen yet, his sequel uh, mini series, I guess. Uh, and it's at waxweb.org. Um, Wax but if anybody's... Yeah, wants to check that out. I, I can't recommend it any more highly. It's definitely a uh, just give into it, let it rewire your brain, just take off. Uh, it's got so many different threads, so many different themes. The visuals are extremely creative. It's sort of almost got an experimental film quality to it, even though it's sort of this narrative, this very personal voiceover driven uh, narrative film. But um, it's it's unheralded uh, as to the extent that people know about it. But it is definitely, I think, a masterpiece. Wait. Wax. I'm at Wax Web, and it says episode zero, and it looks like it's 26 minutes long. Is that what I'm looking okay. at? Yeah, no, that is the. Um, I'll send you the link. It's on his Vimeo page too. If you go to David Blair's Vimeo, hit that link. Uh, that's I think the beginning of the um, uh, mini series. But I'll, I'll send you the link to the uh, film itself. It's either on his Vimeo page or it's on YouTube. I can't remember where exactly it, it lives now. But the feature film, it's like, you know, a 90 minute film. Then you can go look at all those other things afterwards. I, I highly recommend. Okay, great. Um, yeah, send me the link for that. And we'll also put the uh, link for uh, Zeddy. Is that it? Zahedi, Kaveh Zahedi, yeah. Kaveh Zahedi. And, 
And uh, I would be remiss if I didn't tell people to go check me out uh, on Letterboxd, where you can follow along with all the movies that I've been watching. I've been on vacation this week, so I haven't seen a lot of movies uh, over this past week. Mary and I went up to Lake George, um, which was a nice time to be there, except for that our apartment got rained on uh, over the storm. But um, I already hear that. That's okay. We're dealing. Um, but yeah, you can follow me on Letterboxd. I love talking to people also on the uh, Discord in the movies room, uh, the Majority Report Discord. Uh, lovely group of people in there, always willing to chat up some films and TV. I was asked to discuss Columbo by a member of the group today. So uh, I just want to give a shout out to uh, Detective Columbo and uh, suggest that we change. Why? Columbus because Peter Falk and Cassavetes, or was it just a random thing? I, I think, think it's a random thing. thing. These things have a life of them. Columbo on Peacock, I think is why, to be honest with you, I heard that. I met Peter Falk in an elevator in New York City when I was like five or seven, seven, I think it was, or 10. I used to watch Columbo as a kid, and so I knew who he was, and I, I was pretty exciting. That is exciting. Did you ask him? Did you talk to him, or was it just like, there he is? I said, hi, and he said, hi. That was it. That's something that he said. Yeah, you know, you don't want to find out too much about your heroes, you know, like we, we were saying. So, yeah, no, but as obviously, yes, his work with Cassavetes is my main uh, love of him and Mikey and Nikki, which is probably my all time favorite movie. But, you know, Columbo, he knew what he was doing and he hired all his friends, too. You can see all these episodes with Gazzara and Cassavetes and Jenna Rollins. They all showed up there. So anyway, um, and as long as you're are you playing me off? Because I do want to say one other thing. Go ahead. Which is that uh, my film appreciation class, which uh, you can go to my Twitter at Langdon Boom and see that it's signing up now. It starts uh, October 5th and it's going to be 10 films that we show uh, one a week. And uh, then we have an online Zoom discussion. The group of people who join are really intelligent, really uh, insightful. We have great discussions. And for majority report listeners, I was able to get the member rate. Wait for it. You can do it. No? Okay. <laughs> the member rate, which is if you're not a member of the Common Point Queens uh, Community Center, you usually pay $10 extra uh, uh, for the class per, per class or some, some amount. But for Majority Report listeners, you can have the membership rate by just mentioning that you heard about it on the Majority Report with Sam Cedar. Indeed. Uh, just sign up as normal and uh, the director of the program will contact you and give you your uh, discount. Good stuff. And so we look forward to seeing everybody there. You may or may not see one of the Cedar sisters or both of them. They have been past members of the class and a lot of other cool people uh, through the Majority Report family have been there too. So uh, looking forward to seeing you all there shortly. Matthew Film Guy, much appreciated. My pleasure, Sam. Thanks, man. See you next time. Bye-bye. All right, folks. Uh, let's see. We go uh, Freebie Friday? Yeah, I think we will. We'll go Freebie Friday today. Because uh, uh, we got about another 40 minutes of the program today. Don't forget, you can support this show by becoming a member. You go to jointhemajorityreport.com. When you do, you not only get the free show, you get the fun half, too. Although today, it is a Freebie Friday. And we... That doesn't happen every Friday, incidentally. I'm trying to make them scarce. But um, also, don't forget, justcoffee.coop, fair trade coffee, tea, or chocolate. Use the coupon code MAJORITY. Get 10% off. And we have our newsletter. Head over to majority.fm. Scroll all the way down to the bottom. Put your email in. We send you the AM quickie every morning. Uh, Corey and Jack uh, alternate more or less. And uh, send you top headlines, the, some a little bit of analysis, and some stuff maybe that you missed on the show. Um, it is a great read. People are loving it. Check it out. And also, of course, uh, the Discord, MajorityDiscord.com. Um, let's get into uh, some of this. This is, you know, we were talking about... Um, <laughs> this is just like... We are talking about this with Ryan Grimm earlier. Right now, the Republicans have gone all in on the anti-mask mandates. And they are sending people out to school board meetings. It is reminiscent of the Tea Party going to the um, healthcare town halls. And 
there is no doubt it is motivating a lot of these lunatics to get out and they're going to vote. But I also think that it is also sort of like making people aware that they are lunatics. Um, this kid, Grady Hunt, he's a teenager in Rutherford County, Tennessee. Remember like a, like a, I don't know, was it a, a month ago? We played some clips of like parents who were like yelling at people who had come in and testified to a school board meeting that like, you know, you should have masks because it saves lives. Um, Grady Hunt, teenager. He is up. Uh, he is at the school board meeting talking in favor of a mask. And, and listen to what happens. He's talking in favor of masks because someone close to him died. And what, what's the woman behind him? It's just unbelievable. Here it is. Additionally, I'm worried about my family. If I get COVID, I'm gonna bring it to my family. And I talk to my grandparents a lot. They're higher risk than me, so I don't wanna give them COVID. This time last year, my grandmother, who was a former teacher at the Rutherford County School System, died of COVID because someone wasn't wearing a mask. This is a very, this is a very, this is a. Hey guys, we're here to act professional. Please, this, sir, go ahead. Thank you. This is an avoidable issue, and by not wearing masks in schools, it's irresponsible. We're killing people. This is not something that we should be doing for the education of our students. Uh, there you can see the uh, video produced by uh, Newsweek there, I guess they're just pulling it from a, um, you got people laughing at this guy and women just like, oh, this kid he just said his grandmother died. Yeah. I mean, they're, they're laughing because they think, no, he, she didn't die because of, I guess, a mask. Um, uh, but like, how do you know? <laughs> I mean, yeah, aside from all the data that suggests that masks uh, offer protection, not total protection, some protection. I mean, yeah. it, if, if my grandma was around somebody who was unvaccinated and was not wearing a mask and infected her with COVID, I would also say that they killed her for not wearing a mask. Yeah, it is. Um, but like how? And then the guys are like, oh, we're all trying to be professional here. No, actually, the baseline is just be human. But you just like the look at the way that the women roll her, their eyes behind him. Yeah. Like he says, like, I, I mean, just resenting that he's worried about people getting the disease. What did they think was going to happen at this uh, meeting, too? I wasn't prepared for somebody to come up there and talk about how masks were important at this meeting and about how somebody had died. That's not fair. Um,. This is pretty good. And, you know, again, Ryan Grimm made the point that it would be great if we saw on not just MSNBC, CNN, Fox, you're not going to see it, uh, but all the other news outlets. But certainly you would imagine and uh, MSNBC, this would be um, pretty good territory for them uh, to talk about the real conflict of interests that Joe Manchin has, that it's not an ideological thing. He doesn't care about the deficit. It's really, he wants to make sure that there's uh, lower taxes and he doesn't want uh, there to be any type of uh, hampering of the business prospects of coal or let's say uh, pharmaceuticals. Um, at the very least, we get uh, Katie, Potter, or Katie Porter on with uh, Stephanie Rule uh, calling out Joe Manchin and um, other um, so-called centrist Democrats. Using a real corporate profit approach to dealing with those corporations that pay zero, we could generate 700 billion. If we use the corporate minimum tax approach, we're gonna generate 40 billion. Right there, right there, Senator Manchin, right there, anyone who's worried about spending, we can generate the revenue so that this isn't 
about 3.5 trillion in spending. It's not even now about 3.5 trillion in spending because we're going to generate the revenue to pay for these things. I have the will to do it. The question is, does Senator Manchin, or is he more concerned about his corporate donors, including large corporations, the oil and gas industry, the big pharmaceutical industry, and others who are getting away with paying nothing under our current tax system? So in other words, what we're seeing here is just like they're calling a mansion's bluff. If you're really worried about the deficit, let's raise some taxes. But of course, this is exactly what Manchin wants to avoid is raising taxes. He doesn't care about the spending side. It's just a it is just a uh, uh, mechanism in which to um, deflect from the fact that he's trying to avoid raising taxes on wealthy people, on corporations, on industries that he's associated with. I mean, that's basically it. Bottom line, um, we don't need. We don't need the the revenue from taxes to pay for these things. Uh, we have the ability to literally print money. Um, but there's a lot of value in taxing uh, these these entities and wealthy people for the sake of 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 income inequality, of wealth inequality in this country. Uh, and if it has the added bonus of uh, putting Joe Manchin in a tight spot. Um, uh, more power, more power to those uh, revenue raisers. Um, let's go to the IMs. Uh, Sam, get Douglas Rushkoff on the program. Dude is brilliant and can help shed light on a lot of portions of our day. Um, Sam Massachusetts asked Matthew Film Guy if he saw the Bourdain doc. Sorry, I forgot I didn't do that. I'm at your service, Sam. Maybe that with the success of Suns Out, Guns Out fundraising campaign, we could convince Sam to do more things that make him uncomfortable on the live show. How about a fun half where Sam receives a full body massage, uh, complete with scented oils and soothing music? That actually, honestly, is um, is like one of the my worst nightmares. The idea of getting like a you know a stranger to give me a uh, massage with scented oils. That uh, that is that doesn't get any more disturbing for me. Uh, it's always snowy in Ottawa. I know you and Ryan Grimm have actually important things to talk about. However, if Ryan stays to the fun half, I think it would be fun Friday to talk about how he used debate Sam Cedar when Jimmy Sora was getting up, but he's saying Ryan was dodging his offer to debate on the show. Fletch Nasty, uh, Sam, humorous story for Casual Friday. Had an encounter with a guy who said to me, "I don't trust the vaccine uh, because I still continue to take precautions despite being vaxxed. It just reminded me of a story a friend told me about my old football teammates. The story goes the team had just gotten new helmets, so the guy decided to put them to the test, exclaiming helmet check as he headbutt a locker room uh, support beam full force. He immediately got a concussion to the strides of nobody. It's fine now, except he doesn't remember what happened. The moral of the story is just because something is supposed to protect you doesn't mean it always will. Happy Friday, MR crew. Uh, Clown Shoe Mike, that reply to Starnes on Twitter was hilarious. Uh, Cower with Crowder. How has no journalist responded to Cucker Tarlson's what is your favorite sexual position for asking personal questions with whatever position your mom is in? Maybe. Militant apathy. Hate to say it, but I don't think Obama would have had the minerals uh, to do what Biden did. It's all so ridiculous. You can't even get to go to pre-K without shots. Now you've got Dan Dumbass Crenshaw saying a mandate will start a civil war. Dude was in the effing military. They don't give you a choice. They line your ass up first day of basic training and they give you a ton of shots. Whether you want it or not, he's still full of it. Nerd Cheetah. Just want to let you know I appreciate you recognizing out loud that public schools and public education often get scapegoated in times of national crisis. Been an elementary teacher in New York for 20 plus years in this current boots on the ground perspective. CDC and New York uh, SED guidelines are cover your A. Uh, BS that's 100% behind keeping kids in school first, saving lives, is a side deal. Lefter is better, pardon the grammar. Uh, Desert Bialsh, um, 58. Yeah, Dem voters are out there that don't support vaccines and the mandates. I can't with them. Uh, Ricardo Lazarus. Hey, Sam, Portugal is now reaching 80% vaccination rate. We had a huge spike with Delta at the beginning of the summer, but as vaccination advances, the numbers keep going down, despite the country being mostly open for six weeks now. The vaccination seems to be really working against Delta. There was a study that came out with three states. Washington State was one of them. That just came out from data in July that show um, being vaccinated greatly diminishes, significantly diminishes, 
your uh, chance of getting COVID significantly. It greatly diminishes your chance of getting it uh, seriously. Bear, can I please get a shofar for my significant other? It's our one-year anniversary. Uh, anniversary, not university. She is a leftist organizer who continually fights for justice. She's the first person with my politics, to be honest, uh, better politics that I've ever dated, and she inspires. Her biggest disagreement is she doesn't like your libertarian debates because she thinks the libertarians are so stupid they're not even worth laughing over. Fair enough, because libertarians are stupid. Uh, this goes out to her. Sounds great, except for her misunderstanding about the value of those libertarian debates. Yeah, I mean, women have a greater immunity towards libertarianism. I think that's, that's true. I think that's true. Just have, like, I am being uh, logical. Therefore, I am ascendant. No, it's not really for them because they're less of a risk than some of the men are. I, yeah, I think so. And the men feel like it's super empowering. Like, they're... There's like a uh, a mansplain. There's some type of like mansplain virus that uh, that when it hits libertarianism, like it it creates some type of uber force. This is logical. This will allow me to uh, correct everyone as long as I don't actually engage. Ezard. Remandate. I believe we're worried about SCOTUS dismantling the administrative state. Is this a man mandate, a place for that to begin? I, I, I don't know how you could, you know, you could, there's plenty of, um, there's plenty, I guess there's like, even like, I don't know, 115 year old case. I can't remember what it was that uh, said the government has the right to mandate um, stuff like this. Uh, door knocker. Will uh, Biden's vaccine ultimatum also apply to school districts with more than 100 people on staff? No. Private companies and federal employees. That, that, that's my belief. Warren from Toronto. I say, as you know, we have an election here in about 10 days. I agree with Ryan. There might be a liberal contingent that won't vote for Trudeau or will vote for the Conservative Party because of vaccine mandates. Anecdotally, I've talked to people who are not going to vote liberal because of them which is surprising because my district is consistently liberal federally. How large that contingent is, I don't know, but considering where Trudeau is in the poll, and comparably new, new some 2, uh, 2 to 4% is all that's needed to give the election to a conservative. Theorist, the step-up basis has always been tied to the notion that gift tax and estate tax are a combined system. It's only because of exemptions and exemption levels applicable to gift estate taxes that the step-up basis would not be fully justified. Upon the relevant transfer of ownership, a tax would be due whether during the transfer it's life or upon death and paid out for the proceeds of the transfer. Therefore, you would give a step up in basis to reflect that taxes were or are already paid when the transfer at that present value took place. I'm sorry. I, I, I need that. I need that to be like drawn out for me. Uh, Mutz Butts, Joe Manchin's daughter, sounds like a, uh, the title of a Pearl Jam song. <laughs> Mark O'Brien, something to look at. My county, Collin County in North Dallas, leans slightly Republican and is much more vaccinated than Dallas County, which is heavily leans den. After doing a lot of research, I discovered there's less of a political discrepancy and more of an education one. College-educated people, regardless of race and political party, are much more vaccinated than non-college-educated people by a lot. Well, okay, now... It is, it's, it's very difficult though to assess why that is, right? Because non-college educated people are probably working at a job that is more, that is more likely to be hourly. They are more likely to have a greater imbalance in power between them and their employers. They are more likely to not have the opportunity to take a day or two off because they're sick. And so it, it, it may be tied into education level, but it also could be that education level is a proxy for power in the workplace. Look, there's, there's, there's at least 30 million people out there, according to a poll I saw recently, who um, 
they're not hesitant of the vaccine as much as they are hesitant of the process because they can't get time off from work and whatnot. This is this mandate should hopefully um, in some way uh, implicate that. Um, we're going to take a quick break. I'm going to be back in 30 seconds. Quick break. All right, sorry about that. Quick little break. Maybe we can cut that out of the. Uh, we should probably play a little bit of music. Um, uh, this is uh, an oldie but a goodie. I, I wonder what motivates Fox News for bringing out Sarah Palin. <laughs> Like, what, how does that happen? Do you think she's there out should there? be some sort of protocols written up at Fox News. Like, exactly. This is when we go to the Sarah Palin thing. Like, what do you think that maybe she's just like, um, like, what What do you think is happening there? Does she have a PR person that says, like, do you want Palin on for this? And they're like, uh, it's been a while, I guess. Or is she in New York? Or it just seems so weird. I'm not quite clear. Here is uh, the former... Alaska governor, also former reality uh, star, also former Dancing with the Stars, or what? No, singing. What was she? Wasn't she the mystery the singer? Mass singer? What was it? The mass singer. Mass singer. Uh, she did not quit those two last things. She quit the governorship, incidentally, just to remind you. And she was also um, John McCain's vice presidential nominee. Yeah, that John McCain. Um, here she is on Fox News, and maybe they're just trying to figure out, like, how can we attack AOC? Yeah. Wow, AOC, she's really milking this, isn't it? She is such a fake feminist that she would bring up an issue like this and try to use it to make some kind of political point. That, that's, not, that's not equality, right? It's, oh man, don't even get me started on this. This just makes my stomach sick what she has done. She should be embarrassed to even have tried right, to bring up a, an issue like second. that. I remind people, okay, so she, she was basically saying that, you know, Abbott is not a menstruating person. Uh, so it has no sense of like what, you know, this abortion ban or, uh, you know, what six weeks uh, constitutes. Incidentally, uh, the whole heartbeat provision, turns out that's not a heartbeat. There is no heart. It's an embryo at six weeks. It's not even a fetus yet. It doesn't have a heart. There are electrical currents that run through it. Um, and... There's a machine that translates those electrical currents into a thumping sound. It is not like you put a stethoscope on there. You would not hear the embryo uh, heart beating because there's no heart. It has not developed yet. So go back to the beginning, just with that context. Um, and here's Sarah Palin. She's the true feminist. And, and so this is like... This is for those people who watch Fox who want to make sure that they're inoculated 
from saying that you're a misogynist and because because they can look at uh, and crap all over AOC and say like I'm not a misogynist I I'm I'm a feminist <laughs> just that's why I love Sarah Palin so much Wow, AOC, she's really milking this, isn't it? She is such a fake feminist that she would bring up an issue like this and try to use it to make some kind of political point. That that's not it. That's not equality, right? It's oh man, don't even get me started on this. This just <laughs> makes my stomach sick. What she has done, she should be embarrassed to <clears throat> even have tried to bring up a, an issue like that and make her political point. She's so off base politically, but off base even in um, this analogy or whatever it is that she's throwing out there. She's, she's milking the whole female thing. And as a real feminist, I'm embarrassed for her. <laughs> Why, you know, I, I get, where did the idea of milking something come from? Yeah, she got the, she said like the same thing, but like same like three things over and over again. Let's just uh, be clear here. Um, Sarah Palin has been out of politics for 11 years. Sarah Palin, were it not for her being chosen by John McCain, who was afraid of some type of uh, essentially revolt at the Republican National Convention, Sarah Palin would, would just be uh, barely a footnote. So when we talk about milking, Milking the whole female thing. Milking the female thing. Milking the, I mean, she's been milking that nomination to vice presidency for 13 years. More. That's a, that is a, that is one, one, like full udder of milk to have been milked for that long. It's hard to watch someone struggle to speak that much too like she knows she can't she's not saying anything at all she, yeah, she's milking this whole feminist thing and as a fake feminist i just think it's bad that she would try to use this issue to make a political point and that's not quality what do you what let's just play this one more time because it's always fun to listen to the word salad Wow, AOC, she's really milking this, isn't it? She is such a fake feminist that she would bring up an issue like this and try to use it to make some kind of political point. That, that's not it. That's not equality, right? It's, oh, man, don't even get me started on this. This just makes my stomach sick what she has done. She should be embarrassed to <clears throat> even have tried to bring up a, an issue like that and make her political point. She's so off base politically, but off base even in um, this analogy or whatever it is that she's throwing out there. She's, she's milking the whole female thing. And as a real feminist, I'm embarrassed for her. Mm -hmm. Somebody who occasionally talks on microphone, I'm embarrassed for Sarah Palin. Cause she's yeah, like, that's, please yeah, let me be done like, talking. Yeah, exactly. Like, yeah, I, just, like uh, fill the space, fill the space. I'm getting paid for this, right? I wonder if she gets paid. I really wonder what the heck that's about. Um, so as you know, uh, the, there was a, a statue of a Confederate, uh, Confederate general, Robert E. Lee was taken down. Where exactly was it? Sure. Oh, was it Richmond? I thought, okay. But where in Richmond? Was it at the, like the state house or just, uh, is it in just sort of some type of like a generic location in Richmond, uh, Virginia? Um, oh, look. If you live in New York, every day. So Charlottesville, um, Virginia's Market Street Park. Oh, sure. Okay, Charlottesville, Virginia. If you live in New York, every day, not every day, but, but many days, you walk through New York City and you see that they have destroyed history and they have replaced it. They've replaced it with another building. <laughs> the, the change in New York City over the past 25 years has been extraordinary. Buildings that were there for a hundred years, more torn down, replaced with, frankly, in my opinion, very often less attractive buildings, much less character, no history, 
uh, just here uh, around the corner from where we are, there's still only one building left that was associated with the Underground Railroad. And then, and, and buildings that were right next to it were, you know, replaced it with like some crappy hotel, prefab building. That's what happens in a society. Does it happen with statues? Of course, all the time. People become less relevant or society uh, starts to question like the premise behind why, why, are, why are we, why is this symbol important for us to go by? Why was it here in the first place? Why is it, what, is it relevant today? And is it in fact wrong today? I don't know when this particular statue was put up, but if I had to guess, it was between the 1907 and 1925. Uh, the statue was commissioned in 1917 and dedicated in 1924. So, and, and how do I know that? Is simply because this was the pushback following Reconstruction where there was an attempt by, um, by uh, white people to reassert and reinterpret the Confederacy. And um, meanwhile, who better to comment on this type of thing than the Pope of the Jews? Ben Shapiro. Here it is. So my view is that the statue should remain and we should discuss the statue in all of its complexity and all of its nuance. Hey, however, that's really not my issue here. My issue is what we replace things with, what we replace American history with, what we replace that discussion with, pause what it. we have decided to replace pause the discussion it. of pause American pause history it. with. Pause it. Pause it. Statues are not history. They're a discussion in a sort of way. The statues are not Assertion. history. They are, they are assertions. They are attempts to define what history was. History exists outside of statues. And in this instance, that statue was in fact a way to obscure the history of the United States. It was obscuring it. It was obscuring history, and it was an attempt to impose a reality and a future that was based on an ideology. Statues are ideological. They are not reflections of history. They are attempts to remind people of certain things that happened in the past and in certain ways that reflect society's values or how people want society's values to be. They're not history. And if you're talking about like, well, but they're, but they're conversation starters. There's a lot of different ways you could start the conversation of, uh, of, of the Civil War. But continue. So my view is that the statue should remain and we should discuss the statue in all of its complexity and all of its nuance. Hey, however... That's really not my issue here. My issue is what we replace things with, what we replace American history with, what we replace that discussion with, and what we have decided to replace the discussion of American history with, what we have decided to replace our own history with is a perverse, simplified wokeness that does spell the end of America in pretty much all of its forms. Not the getting rid of the Robert E. Lee statue per se, but what we are replacing it with. And what I mean here is that there was a time capsule that was buried under the Robert E. Lee statue in the base of the statue. We're now replacing it. Okay, this is the part that's kind of astonishing. And also, the imagery that was associated with the removal of the Robert E. Lee statue. Right? If you're going to remove the iconography of the past, it should be done in a sort of, I would say, solemn fashion. It should be done very seriously. Instead, the Robert E. Lee statue was removed to the wild celebration of a crowd below as though they were toppling a statue of Saddam Hussein or something. Robert E. Lee does not preside over the country, wild. nor did he ever that's preside great. over the country per se, right? He was the general of the Confederacy. The Confederacy was defeated between 1861 and 1865. And uh, you saw one of the people who was taking this thing down, who'd been tasked with taking this down, putting up the Black Lives Matter fist as this was taken down. Now you can say that maybe the statue should be taken down, but replacing it with the ideology of Black Lives Matter, which is that America is invariably racist, not only conflicts with the actual imagery, which is a black man taking down a statue of a Confederate general, which does not bespeak the white supremacy of the United States in 2021, but also Black Lives Matter is, is pushed and, and based on a lie, the lie that black Americans are immutably 
stricken by the American systems of power. That it's, it's the same sort of rationale as critical race theory, Black Lives Matter. And if you're a black person in America, you live with the boot of America on your throat all day long. That obviously is not true. I mean, we're literally taking down statues right now right, that offend people. But that sort of imagery is telling. Stop, stop, stop. Is it like, yeah, first off, I can't. This feels like one of those days where it's like I didn't do my homework yeah. and I'm coming in and I'm just rambling. He is arguing that the fact that there is a guy giving the black power uh, sign is an indication of that we are not immutably subject to white supremacy, which I would agree is the case. But in fact, it is achieving exactly what you say you're implying should be achieved and can be achieved in America. Well, this is it, man. It's happening. Like, and it's, is it, is it, is the job done? No. Uh, but they're, we're doing a little bit of cleanup right now. It's funny that he brings up the Saddam instance himself because that's exactly what these things are. Like, totally. These are just like really old Saddam statues, except to Confederates. Exactly. Exactly. And um, the, the, Taking it down is, in fact, a um, is a small, tiny step towards both acknowledging that the values that raised that statue were wrong, that the statue's continued existence imparts values that we as a society have evolved past. We haven't necessarily reached a uh, full evolvement yet. And then, you know, like I saw somebody on Twitter, uh, I can't remember which right winger it was, like, name one policy that's improved from this. You know what? Give me another fucking, give me another freaking uh, 10 or 15 years. And maybe we'll start to see some policies when people don't walk by a statue and think like, oh, what could have been wrong about the Confederacy that we would venerate the guy who led it? I think that that this conversation is developing to the point that we're starting to remove these things actually is a sign of like this sort of policy improving society somewhat. And and here he is going like BLM says that uh, America is immutably oppressing black people. Well, uh, dude, no, actually, when we take those statues down, we're showing that there is at least a tiny bit of mutability. And it also expresses the idea that like there's more mutability that can be had. And so, in fact, no, um, if BLM's ideology was that America is immutable, they wouldn't be doing this. Yeah. And it, it's all about it's not about essences. It's about systems. <laughs> exactly. And 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 the idea that um, uh, America is unchangeably white supremacy, right? Wh a, a white supremacist society would mean that there was absolutely no point to take down the statue. Right. And no point. Yeah to protest that it's invariably white supremacist yeah actually if you look at most uh, historians of race they can, they outline that actually racism has gotten worse particularly as the capitalism developed as a rationale to you know justify taking from people and force them to do labor and and we can see that there is an ebb and flow that's why i can guess without without any basis other than just knowing our history when that statue went up They'd rather turn it into like that sort of philosophical about immutably, uh, immutable oppression rather than just a historical one about it, who put this up and for what. Exactly. It just sounds to me like he hadn't done his homework that day and was just trying to come up with something. Is there anything more to that? That's it, right? Uh, lastly, speaking about uh, not doing any of your homework. So apparently Stephen Crowder is still alive. Um... He made it through his um, his rebounding from our non-debate. Um, fine. <laughs> and uh, how do you how do you uh, rebound from that when you've got to? I mean, let, let's just understand that. Like Crowder is um, there's you know he understands the YouTube business streaming business in a way that I think I may never understand. Right. And I will say like, um, you know, my experience with that, that, that whole debate scenario where Ethan Klein brought me on, Ethan Klein understands that business too, because we were supposed to go on 
I was supposed to crash that debate, and the debate was supposed to happen a week before it ultimately did. Crowd are canceled at the last minute because we had ended our show early. And Ethan was like, he's watching your show because he's afraid that you're going to actually come on in this thing. And remember that when he said that to us? And I'm like, no way, dude. That can't be. That would be nuts. And then, in fact, Crowder admitted it during the debate. In so, an attempt to own you somehow. Well, yeah, he, <laughs> he, uh, he, he was... He understood the mechanisms much more than he could actually sort of break it down and, and react to it. Yeah. But my point is, when he looks, he comes back from his vacation or, you know, his uh, medical treatment to deal with a bruised ego, he looks at his numbers and they're down. When we take a vacation, the numbers go down. So Crowder's saying to himself, how am I going to raise my numbers? How am I going to get my people back? Oh, I know. In-depth policy uh, analysis. Yeah, am I going to break it down? Am I going to, uh, you know, break down the bit? Oh no, actually, no. That's not what I'm going to do. I'm going to uh, dish out a healthy dose of transphobia. No, because we wouldn't want uh, we wouldn't want anyone to perpetuate, of course, the stereotype of princess. That's not something that we would uh, we would ever want there. Uh, yeah, oh, you can be a little more timely no. there, uh, no. Tim. With yeah. the, uh, well, as long as you're a man. Yeah, as long as you're a man. It's just like, oh, no, listen. <laughs> listen, this is just, uh, I believe I'm a woman. Really? How many transgender individuals mm -hmm. uh, are saying, I want to be a woman? Why? So I can become a scientist. No, they want to become a woman <laughs> so they can have big old fake tits and clown makeup. Let's be really <laughs> clear about it. Okay? And then all of a sudden it's like, yeah. oh, Caitlyn Je Bruce Jenner, is now Caitlyn Jenner, is dressed like a Barbie, wearing a corset with those dimensions, and is wearing a princess tiara. Oh, but yeah. hey, well, no, that's fine. Just not for biological women. Well, did you see the examples to you? She's like, oh, princess, what do you need? And she's like, why can't we call him scientist doctor? Because I don't call my son, oh, scientist, what do you need? Oh, well, I don't, like, that's in, that's he, the most I don't believe thing. he's ever been to an accredited university. Yeah, no, I don't it, believe yeah. that she has a degree yeah. for me to call her a it's doctor. also yeah. one. <laughs> it's a bit early to be called. And I love how she hey, referred engineer. to her husband. What? Yeah, her husband as my child's father. Right. What is it with labels in you? Like, is that not appropriate? Are you not husband and wife anymore? That's fine. You could say. Oh my! Yeah, I wouldn't be. I don't know. Well, well. I hope if you leave, I feel that you uh, don't try and take any uh, said finances from your child's father, since you're such a strong, independent. Yeah, woman. that's true. No, no, no. Don't no, need rescuing. No, I want my cake and eat it too. <laughs> so Jenner, <laughs> the great content mine for these guys. Uh, it's un unbelievable. Uh, the idea that wait, wait, you didn't become a woman to become a scientist. Wait, became... the idea that he thinks, I mean, what's going on in his mind where he thinks that people are changing genders because they want just big boobs to play with like that. No, people are changing genders so they're more comfortable with their expression and then they're going and yes, some are scientists, some are lawyers like what does he think? Like they all just, I, 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 I don't know. Also drag queens, notably not dra transgender people for the oh, most part, yes. for yeah, the most part. Exactly. Like, who, who he was referring to was literally like men, like performing as women, like not actual transgender. Right. Right. This is about the drag queens, like reading to kids, right? That's what he's been freaking out about for years now. Uh, I mean, he should know the difference because he has dressed up, uh, as a woman on multiple, multiple occasions. Yeah. Is that why he did it? I mean, <laughs> honestly, like this guy, no matter how much he tries to uh, sort of run from himself. Mom, 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 why did you do that to me? I mean, I feel like this, it feels like envy a little bit. It is, there is some, well, he's like saying, you want your cake and eat it too. <laughs> some of us can't have our cake or eat it. Our dads won't even let us have the cake in the first place. Some of us have our fathers breathing down our neck and can't be the people we were meant to be. But when we dress up like that, we have to uh, pretend like it's uh, uh, like a sketch. Right, right. Like we're we have to pretend like we're mocking people. There, there, there is such deep, dark darkness there that they they always return to that. 
Like, I mean, you just like contemplate, like, what what is the impact of transgenderism in our society? Like, what measurable impact to people other than who are transgender really is there? They act like they're coming for them. I mean, think about like what has taken place just over the past, I don't know, like five weeks. People dying in floods in their own basements. Like, you know, like, you know, people like, you know, wildfires and, um, and, and thousands upon thousands of people dying because they're refusing to get vaccinated. How many stories have we just seen? We really, bro, there are probably more clips of people sitting in hospital beds saying, I wish I believed in the vaccine and gotten the vaccine and crying and worrying about that they're not going to be there for their kids. We have only seen more people than that, than, first of all, transgender people that Steven Crowder will ever meet in his life or that most people will ever meet in their lives. And we've probably seen like more people just like plea with other people to get the vaccine because they didn't do it and they're, they're on their deathbed. But yet, it's the transgender. That's the, that is the fixation. It's really, I mean, you know, and I'm trying to get into the head of like, you know, somebody who has, sees this as a problem. Like all the things you have to, you know, it's like, it's like all the things you have to drive by on your, dri- on your drive to the, to the gender. Some conservatives are still talking about Afghanistan. You know, there's certain things like a big boy topics you could be talking about. But this is like, this is why Shapiro loves whenever like an athlete says they're doing, dealing with a mental health issue. Because they can just jump with both feet into like mocking that person. So they don't have to talk about, you know, um, the other things that are less useful to talk about. This is like, honestly, they're doing doing a show for like sixth graders, sixth graders who have been, you know, like sort of sheltered and, and sort of prevented from, I mean, it's, 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 it's fascinating to me. Like they're grown men, they're grown people. Yeah. Especially both Crowder and Shapiro, like they, they started as younger people, but now they're getting in their thirties. Yeah. I mean, come bit. on like, guys. guys. Like I'm already, I'm feeling already like I wasn't as young as when I started here. Like you yeah, guys have been around these for get a long, a long time. time. It is really amazing. Really amazing. Um, All right. We're going to read some uh, IMs. I think uh, we've covered that. And we're going to read some IMs and then uh, get out of here. Justin, phone today. I wanted to get the news out from the Pacific Northwest about a local radio host, Todd Herman. Rhetoric is affecting our area. I finally found out how right wing he is. When I asked where he gets his news, I knew it. It was Breitbart, Fox, Epoch Times. But I've always felt he was libertarian. That is so close to understanding progressive point of view that when he talks to me, uh, just a person about getting state help. But uh, because of the radio show I tuned into today, he is anti-vax, anti-mask. I can't believe it. Someone who helped take care of his dementia mother. I don't uh, think he would vax uh, or mask for her. Um, I'm at a loss what to do. I'm dreadfully worried. Oh, wow. So it sounds like um, you knew this person off air. Um, Eve one Haxor, Jimmy Dore has been added to the media bias chart that boomers love to post on Facebook at the far bottom left. I'm sure this is the final sign of the end times left is best, except for him. Not sure. I fully understand that. Uh, insult to the far left Wayne Kerr. Oh, okay. Wayne Kerr. <laughs> uh, <laughs> nice. A uh, little disappointed you didn't touch on the intercept reporting on gain of function research. Yeah, oh, we'll bring that up. I mean, there was a, a report that came out that an assessment by some scientists who say that, in fact, the NIH was sort of like um, second order financing studies into gain of function research, which my understanding of it is, is when they take um, viruses. And they sort of don't literally put them on steroids, but, you know, from as a as sort of a vernacular, they put them on steroids to make them more virulent as a way of studying them. I guess my theory about that, as far as I understand it is, and, and somebody knows, but I don't, uh, that the more virulent it is, the more its attributes are uh, easier to examine. 
Uh, that same study apparently said it's uh, highly unlikely that what they, b based upon what they understood that those uh, those studies were doing, and, and includes like a, apparently at the Wuhan lab, that these things wouldn't have, were, were, were too dissimilar from COVID-19 to be the source of COVID. But who knows? There's no doubt in my mind that um, particularly regardless of, of, of where COVID-19 came from, that we need to have tighter controls on this stuff because it, it can be really bad. Um, I don't know that it really makes that much of a difference in the final analysis as in terms of like COVID itself as to where it came from. I think there's a lot of implications that it's like the pandemic sort of people like to um, talk about this stuff a little bit and hint at things. I mean, there is a greater gulf, it seems to me, between it coming from nature and it leaking out of a, it coming from nature and then leaking out of a lab. There's a greater gulf between it leaking out of a lab and it being planned than there is exactly. it coming from nature and leaking out of a lab. Gagagool, I was in DC 20 years ago. The people showed up in to ineffectual protests against Supreme Court's Bush v. Gore decision in 2000 are the same folks who showed up to ineffectual marches against the Iraq war in 2003. Um, well, there were more for the war. There were more for the war. I was down in uh, those DC protests. Butt sauce. Chris, Chris, Chris Rock had a bit about how Americans started coming together to hate terrorists, and that was cool, and then to hate foreigners, and that was cool, and then to hate Muslims. And that's when Rock said, you know, black people and Jewish people are next. The, that train ain't never late. Uh, Emma Knight Shemalian. Uh, hot take South Park more than anything else ruined my generation. It taught us that caring was lame, that bigotry is cool and edgy, especially if you dress it up with ironic humor. I think there's something for that argument. And that, like, being anti war was sort of like could be a Republican thing. I mean, maybe that wasn't an explicit message, but that was kind of a message I and a lot of people in my uh, early college ha got from that stuff. Mm. Thames Darwin, Sam, like you, I heard the attacks happen live on Stern. I remember hearing uh, about the landing gear on that first plane, but even more, I recall Stern reporting that a second plane had hit. Between parking my car on the lot and getting into my office and turning on the radio, they had gone on the warpath. It happened that quickly. Um, Aaron is not cool. Can I get a show far? It's my birthday, and I'm 34, and I'm finally writing and directing my first movie this year. Oh, congratulations. Awesome. <laughs> I learned about Kaba Zahadi from R.M. Brown, who stand Zahadi and interviewed Zahadi. Uh, we're going to have R.M. Brown on soon. We should, we, we should try and work on that. Uh, Columbo is dope. Yo, says Monkey Spank. Fart sound. How Jewish is this film class? Will it be authentic Hollywood experience? <laughs> Chris Burdick. Sam, if you do nothing else today, you've got to make a sound drop out of that moment when Matthew Film Guy said, I am a sex addict. <laughs> Slappy Tub, Sam, could you talk about your thoughts uh, when a, pl a plane uh, crashed into Rockaway, I believe not long after 9-11? Yeah. Yeah, people are freaking out. There was a plane that cr crashed into, well, uh, you know, out. I, I think it had just taken it off from LaGuardia. I can't remember exactly. But it was like uh, two months later, maybe. It happened on November 12, 2001, remember? Yes. Uh, Governor H. Vac. But between that and the anthrax and everything else, it was all just sort of like one big mishmash. Everybody was in a state of shock. The, guy, the woman seen laughing at the kid in Rutherford County School Board has been identified as an employee at Cigna, and she has now been fired. Oh, wow. Kowalski uh, from Nebraska. Vouch is doing a 24-hour video game charity stream to raise money for Planned Parenthood starting today at 3 p.m. Given the state of the anti-choice crowd's assault on freedom of planning, Planned Parenthood needs all the support they can get. Yes. Folks, check it out. Should we raid his uh, Twitch? 3 p.m.? I don't think it's going now. Um, Sam, what comparisons could you draw between the astroturfed Obamacare town hall response and the current right-wing school board agitation happening around the same time late in the summer, the first of the year of a first-term president? Well, you made a bunch of c comparisons. There is um, uh, been reports of the right wing funding for the for these um, um, 
you know, uh, uh, things. I think that it's the, the but 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 the and it's a bank shock, right? Um, on, on what they're attacking. But here's the difference: Obamacare was going to pass during this time, and and I don't know that anti-masking and we went through this with uh with um ryan is going to be as salient from now um and jay connor i wonder where those signs came from at that school board meeting i mean it has to be astroturfed right well i imagine that it it is you know there's money md lawyer doomed yourself now uh jenna from st louis uh, I am a licensed massage therapist. Let me come rub you. Smiley face. Eh, I'm not sure. I'm not sure. It's not that I, uh, it's not, it's not the license. Um, real ace attorney. Damn, Sam, those 70 sideburns are unreal. Please never change them. Uh, the Chris Lapaco. Moloch is literally the major of my YouTube channel. <laughs> Sam from Ottawa, uh, Canada's English language debate was last night. The format and moderator made it into nothing but petulant children squabbling. Uh, the American influence continues. Sorry about that. Uh, Justin, oh, what happened to, do we have that uh, clip? Didn't I put that clip in um, from Buffalo? Oh, we have it? Well, let's play it. Huh? I guess we'll do it Monday. We don't have time now. Um, Okay, a couple more of these and then we're out of here. Uh, Gagabool. Oh, wait, no, I already did that. Till. Uh, Sam, what comparisons could you draw? Oh, I did that one already too. Jennifer for St. Louis. Oh, uh, yeah, okay. Ryan Cole. Palin's world salad is the direct precursor of Trump's slurred world sal word salad. Indeed. Friend described libertarianism as, as astrology for men. Astrology makes more sense, in my opinion. 69. Bra, the non-aggression principle, bro. Cops will use lethal force to make sure nobody takes my private property that I inherited from my parents. I worked hard to be born to them, and I'll use that land for something important. Damien. Did you have to pee? I did, yeah. Sorry. <laughs> God cat uh, studio should be ready by 926 my birthday I had reservations for windows on the world 92601 my uh, 13th I had to uh, settle for Nobu also uh, come home Brian be my husband okay Bill O'Reilly slate book killing bin Laden Obama's continuation of black on black crime <laughs> uh, big dick Cheney energy uh, weren't there multiple brawls at the Palin residence the police had to break up weird she's capable of being embarrassed for anyone else Sam's only fan. Hey, Sam, can we please get Tom Hartman on to talk about his new um, book, Hidden History of American Healthcare? Very good stuff. Yeah, I think we can do that. Travis from Pittsburgh. Wow, Ben Shapiro is able to shove so much stupid into a short period of time. Two more IMs, and then we're out of here. Donda Defender. I don't. I think Donda was great. People get so wrapped up in the God of it all, they ignore that there's a song on there called Jesus Lord, but all that calls for free and available abortions criticizes America's foreign domestic policy. Cheers. And the final I am of the week. Chili Pecker, we just had statues removed from Richmond, too. I've had several people in my comments saying that Robert E. Lee is one of the good Confederates, as if he didn't also own slaves. He's good in the sense that he sucked at being a general to the point where he lost a war he probably could have won. There you go. That helped. All right, folks. Matt, Bradley, great job this week. See you folks on Monday. It might take all the strength I got. To get to where I want But I know somehow I'm gonna get there I wasn't looking when I just got caught Between the truth and the light bar But finding out won't make me feel any better Yeah, I know the clock is ticking But the meds are gonna kick in